On the early morning of September 11, 2001, Hijackers took control of four commercial airliners en route to California, taking control of their cockpits and commandeering the planes, with at least three of the airliners succeeding, crashing at high speeds into both Twin Towers and the Pentagon as their targets in a kamikaze fashion, killing everyone on board the flights as well as many more occupants in the buildings. The fourth remaining airliner, United Airlines Flight 93 from Newark International Airport, which was the third targeted flight to depart, lifting off at 8.42 a.m. en route to San Francisco, crash into a field in Stony Creek Township near Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 10.03 a.m. The third successful striking airliner, which departed fourth at 8.20 a.m. en route to Los Angeles, was American Airlines Flight 77 from Washington Dulles International Airport and crashed into the western facade of the Pentagon in Arlington County, Virginia at 9.37 a.m. The west side of the Pentagon sustained significant damage and a portion of it collapsed 33 minutes later at 10.10 a.m. The first two airliners en route to LAX took off from Logan International Airport in Boston, Massachusetts. They were American Airlines Flight 11 at 7.59 a.m., which flew into Manhattan, New York, striking the northern facade of the North Tower of the World Trade Center at 8.46 a.m., as United Airlines Flight 175, that also departed at 8.14 a.m., struck the South Tower 49 minutes later at 9.03 a.m. The South Tower, which was struck second, fell first collapsing at 9.59 a.m., only having burned for 56 minutes. The North Tower collapsed at 10.28 a.m., after burning for an hour and 42 minutes. Fire caused by the impact of the planes and the explosion of fuel was believed to be the reason why the Twin Towers collapsed into total destruction, becoming what is thought to be the most loss of life amongst the nearly 3,000 victims who perished from the September 11th attacks between the three regions of the United States and the destruction was eventually verified by government and city officials as well as mainstream news having brought on their architectural and physics experts that evening and the next day supporting the same theory. But soon after, independent and scientific skeptics through basic observations and numerous early witness accounts disagreed with the authorities' instant conclusion in how the Twin Towers were destroyed by just plane impacts and subsequent fires and that the obliteration of the World Trade Center was also due in part to pre-placed explosives inside the buildings, which conspiracy theorists label today and accuse the attacks as primarily being a controlled demolition. As a consequence of the September 11th attacks, 2,977 people were killed exactly, making nearly 3,000 people perishing from the largest terrorist attack in the world. But if the truth be told, the immediate deaths included 125 at the Pentagon, and 265 passengers throughout the four planes. When Flight 175 struck the South Tower, it's estimated that 637 people were killed instantly or trapped at and above the floors of impact. When Flight 11 struck the North Tower, it ensured the deaths of 1,402 occupants at and above the aircraft's impact zone. That's a total of 2,429 victims on average which accounts for about 80% of the 9-11 deaths as a result from the hijacked airliners alone and not the subsequent collapse or demolition of the Twin Towers. So you have to wonder, if we're seeking justice and accountability for those innocent lives lost on 9-11, in consideration of unanswered questions regarding the hijackings and hijackers, as well as the consequential quagmire with the unjustified invasion of Iraq and failed war on terrorism, in those victims' names, why is the 9-11 Truth Movement only focused on the destruction of the World Trade Center and not on any of the hijackings or airports of 9-11, especially Boston Logan? Depending on who you talk to, the 9-11 Truth Movement basically started as a result of the September 11th victims' families who got the ball rolling, lobbying the U.S. government to carry out an investigation into the terrorist attacks, resulting in the formation of the 9-11 Commission, based on many unanswered questions on how their loved ones perished, warning signs, and what government could have done to prevent it, consequently also as a result of the Joint House Inquiry of Senate Select Committee's investigation, previously known as the JIS report. But the 9-11 Commission, having released their report in July of 2004, have been met with scrutiny, being rejected by most victims' families and a great chunk of the American public, if not the world. But those dissenters of the official story, galvanized by the 9-11 Commission report, are, for the most part, taking great issue and concern only with what truly happened to the Twin Towers, making the shocking proclamation of calling it an inside job, the World Trade Center, 9-11. But, inside job was not a phrase coined afterward or by the 9-11 truth movement regarding the September 11th attacks. Rather, it was invented on the evening of 9-11 
by Boston's WBZ4 with Joe Bergantino, already in prime position for the early stages of the investigation covering Logan Airport. Now, hundreds of federal investigators have descended on Logan Airport trying to determine just how those terrorists hijacked the two jets. Our I-team has been looking into security at Logan. I-team reporter Joe Bergantino is here with the latest information. Joe? Well, Sarah, what exactly happened at Logan Airport this morning is now the subject of a massive investigation. The head of Logan Security says the airport is, quote, as secure, if not more secure, than any other airport in this country. But a review of FAA action paints a very different picture. Two years ago this month, the FAA revealed that security breaches at Logan were a common occurrence. The FAA found at least 136 security violations at the airport. Undercover FAA special agents posing as passengers found that security hired by the airlines routinely failed to detect test items such as pipe bombs and guns hidden in bags. Those same special agents gained access to airplanes parked at gates overnight. Agents frequently gained access to other restricted areas without ever being questioned. The government fined Massport and some major airlines $178,000. And one expert told me today that no airport in this country is secure. The problem, he said, the airlines are responsible for security checkpoints in the terminals. They contract security out to the lowest bidder, who in turn hires lower, low-wage workers with no experience. Something else to consider, tonight one Bay State Congressman is saying the hijackings at Logan were an inside job. 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 WBZ4 reported in the late evening of September 11th, stating local government sources believed that the attacks launched from Logan Airport was an inside job. And throughout this film, there will be more WBZ4 exclusive coverage on the 9-11 investigation that most of the public is not familiar with. Because before the destruction and the loss of life, when it comes to visibly backtracking where the attacks are initiated from, having come from three airports, it was later determined that there were 19 hijackers amongst the four flights, and they used box cutters to kill passengers, flight crew, and take control of the planes. But to determine is not the same as to confirm. But right after the attacks, there were numerous anomalies clearly making it difficult for government authorities to immediately identify these suspected 19 hijackers based upon early news reports and interviews with victims' families and airline personnel who received the phone calls from the doomed hijacked flights. As for full names and identities of the 19 hijackers, 15 of them being Saudi nationals, two from the United Arab Emirates, one from Lebanon, and the other from Egypt. This complete set and their photos was not made public until September 27, 2001, over two weeks later. Three of the non-Saudi hijackers soon were deemed by investigative authorities at the time as the masterminding ringleaders of the whole terrorist operation, famously dubbed as the Hamburg Cell, due to the report of entry coming into the country originally from Germany, and essentially, most of these hijackers are the central figures this film will be underlining. Because the following day, after 9-11, on September 12th, around 2.15 p.m. with ABC News, already reporting that there were 12 hijackers identified, Brian Ross reports about the immediate FBI dragnet going on in the northern New England states, where he verbally releases one of the names of the identified hijackers, which ends up being Flight 11 hijacker. Mohammed Atta. Well, here is some information that is quite hard. The uh, discovery of the car last night in the Boston airport uh, led uh, FBI agents to a man they have told us was one of the terrorist hijackers, an Egyptian national by the name of Mohammed Atta, who apparently was on the INS watch mm. list. It was Mr. Atta who spent the summer of 2000 in Venice, Florida, with another man learning how to fly at uh, the Huffman Aviation Service in Venice. Nearly an hour and a half later, at 3.45 p.m., the FBI and Attorney General John Ashcroft, having no flight manifest or list of hijacker names to release amongst the four flights, only stated that there was a ratio of three to six hijackers per plane, where subsequently, some of the news sources began stating that there was a scale of 12 to 24 hijackers. The four planes were hijacked by between three and six individuals per plane using knives and box cutters and in some cases making bomb threats. Following that, on September 13th, as early as 9.22 a.m., NBC first shows a photo of Mohammed Atta while reporting on some of the flight schools he attended in Florida, 
Other news sources later in the day will additionally show a photo of Marwan El Shehi also claiming him to be his cousin, essentially the media only making two official hijacker photos public. At 12.57 p.m., the FBI and Attorney General, during the second press conference still having no flight manifest or list of hijacker names, changed the ratio of suspects on each plane from four to five hijackers per plane, but could only state that there were 18 hijackers throughout the four flights. And last but not least, the total number of hijackers to our best uh, estimate and our best knowledge given the information at this time on the four planes that crashed was at least 18 and less contradicted by uh, evidence which uh, we wouldn't anticipate uh, two planes had five hijackers and two other planes had four hijackers each the following morning on september 14th cnn was able to first pick up the names of the 18 hijackers which had shown that the pilot hijacker Hani Hanjour of Flight 77, the plane that struck the Pentagon, was missing. But in the afternoon, after the prayer and remembrance services, CNN and ABC News released official scale of 19 hijacking suspects included with Hanjour, but for some reason momentarily indicated on ABC's list of 19 hijacker names, had also included seat and passenger numbers. But United Airlines flights 93 and 175 did not include seat numbers at all. But an anomaly still occurs on the two American Airlines flights. On Flight 77, the alleged pilot hijacker Hani Hanjour neither has a passenger or seat number listed for his name, while Nawaf Al Hazmi only has a passenger number but no seat number provided. And on Flight 11, all the seat and passenger numbers are listed for the five hijackers, except for the alleged team leader and pilot, Mohammed Atta, who only has a seat number. 30 minutes later, the FBI and Attorney General held their third press conference, making all 19 hijacker names official amongst the four airliners. But five hours later, at 8.21 p.m., ABC News and Brian Ross, continuing to cover the dragnet, demonstrate CGI models of the four airliners in an attempt to show which hijackers were on each flight and seated, except for the United Airlines flights, which authorities hadn't provided yet. But when it came to the American Airlines flights, again, no seat numbers are provided for Hanjour and no Waffle Hazmi on Flight 77. But now on Flight 11, Anta has seat numbers, but Abdelaziz Al Amari is missing, basically only displaying four hijackers instead of five. Two days later, on the early morning of September 16th, around 1.30 a.m., CNN now becomes the first network up until this point to release a bulk of the hijacking identities in which so far, only two accurate photos of hijackers are publicly shown one of Marwan al Shehi and the other famous scowling photo of Mohammed Atta. <clears throat> the U.S. Justice Department has also released photographs now. But CNN was only able to provide photos of eight individuals believed to be suspects from only three of the four hijacked planes, excluding Flight 77 that hit the Pentagon. However, there becomes a problem with the eight photos they show. Three of the photo identities of hijacking suspects are actually Saudi Airlines pilots who were alive in Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, and Morocco, having similar tribal names of the hijackers, but claimed to have their IDs stolen. Saeed El Ghamni, the pilot from Tunisia, was alive, and his photo was displayed as being thought of as the official Flight 93 hijacker, Saeed El Ghamni from Florida. On the set of Flight 11 identities, on the bottom right corner, the photo for Abdelaziz Al Omari is actually Abdul Rahman Al Omari, who was also found alive in Saudi Arabia and interviewed there five days later by CNN on September 21st, after having just relocated there from Vero Beach, Florida, just days before 9-11. And the other thought to be Flight 11 hijacker, on the top right hand corner, Whale Al Shari is actually the living Walid Ahmed Al Shari that lived in Morocco, whose photo is instead represented as the official Whale Al Shari, the actual brother of Walid Mohammed Al Shari. These stolen IDs and mix-ups basically escalated into the myth by conspiracy theorists that four of the seven hijackers were alive after September 11th. But in hindsight, what does this say about the authorities or CNN only showing a partial roster of hijacker photos for three of the four flights, but screw up on demonstrating at least three hijacker identities who actually turned out being alive? 
when we know certainly by then, the FBI already had plenty of time to seize the security CCTV videos from Boston Logan and Newark airports, and should have been able to visibly identify all the hijackers boarding from the departure areas based on the flight manifest so to avoid any misinformation or misleading the public. What's also unusual about this September 15th CNN report, when accounting all four 9-11 flights in what becomes the official story, is that none of the CCTV security videos from Boston Logan and Newark airports have ever been made public, except when it comes to Flight 77 for the Pentagon attack, which again, with authorities having flight manifests, none of the hijacker photos from that flight are shown in this report that day. But the screw up with the charting the living Abdul Rahman Al Amari being on Flight 11 with Mohammed Atta is a perplexing mistake, being that the actual Abdul Aziz Al Omari, alleged to have been on the flight, will be shown on surveillance video with Atta three days later. But two days before, on September 18th, things became really twisted, as the only possible case for real living hijackers is reported from ABC News by Mohammed Atta's father in Egypt. He was killed, I do not know, but he called me a few days ago after the attack. Do you see me sad? The FBI says unless he pulled a last minute switch, Ada died as he planned when his plane crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. On September 19th, practically all the news sources released CCTV video at Portland International Jetport in Maine on September 11th, capturing hijackers Atta and Alamari about to board their connecting flight to Logan. On September 22nd, 2001, just five days before all the hijacker photos were made public, Time Magazine's website published an exclusive article titled, An Inside Job? U.S. officials are compiling what one called, growing evidence that other hijackings may have been planned for September 11. Officials from both the government and the airline industry tell Time Magazine that a knife-like weapon was found on each of two separate Delta Airlines aircraft later that day, although neither plane took off due to the nationwide grounding after the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks on hijacked United and American Airlines planes, government sources would not describe in detail the nature of the weapons found on the Delta flights last week, but one official disclosed that another weapon was discovered on at least on other aircraft owned by a fourth airline. The government official refused to name that carrier. Investigators are not yet certain how these weapons came to be on board the aircraft, but they are increasingly believing that the weapons may have been prepositioned by accomplices for use by others. As one U.S. official told Time, these look like inside jobs. The new evidence is causing officials to broaden their investigative and security efforts to encompass not only the carry-on bag screening system, but the entire aviation security apparatus at U.S. airports. The new evidence raises the worrisome possibility that the hijackers may have had accomplices deep within the secure areas of airports that may include the shops and restaurants in the terminal behind the metal detectors or amongst the thousands of people who work in catering, fueling, or cleaning aircraft or anyone who might have access to the airplane before takeoff. Other hijackings may have been planned for September 11? Inside jobs? Accomplices deep within secure areas of airports? So many questions remain, but no answers. Why isn't there any security CCTV video released from Logan Airport, especially when the most vivid and memorable part of the attacks were the airliners crashing into the World Trade Center filled with passengers? A sensitive priority as one would imagine, as nothing should be in the way for the public to see, as far as where those flights took off from. But yet, over a week later, authorities are barely able to release Four security videos still capturing hijacker Atta and Alamari at Jetport, Maine. The previous airport they depart from, just landing at Logan, to subsequently connect and hijack American Airlines Flight 11 to strike the World Trade Center first? And a better question, why did Atta and Alamari travel out of the way on September 10th to Portland, Maine, the day before 9-11, further complicating their mission, rather than just board Flight 11 at Logan, since they had already been in Boston on 9-10, where Atta had rented the cars from. According to the official story, on Monday, September 10, 2001, the day before 9-11, hijackers Mohammed Atta and Abdelaziz Alamari drive in a rental car they've leased from Boston Logan Airport and check into this Comfort Inn in Portland, Maine at 5.43 p.m., which is a short five-minute drive to Jetport, the local airport which they depart from early the next day back to Boston Logan. Atta and Alamari are filmed at 8.41 p.m. at this ATM machine, and at 9.15 p.m. getting photographed at this Jetport gas station just a few blocks away. And the last time they are caught on film that night, at this Walmart store, 
where they were seen moving around the aisles for about 20 minutes. The final time they are captured on film is the next morning on September 11th, going through the Jetport security at 5.45 a.m., with their next destination to Boston where they allegedly meet with three other hijackers out of eight already present there at the airport and boarded American Airlines Flight 11 departing around 8 a.m., while the other remaining five hijackers, led by Marwan al Shahi, boarded United Airlines Flight 175 departing 15 minutes later, with ultimately both planes crashing into the World Trade Center about an hour later. But this part of the official story with the unnecessary connecting flight makes the route of travel too risky and has been a problem with most authority figures and experts on the matter who can't give a clear answer as to why Atta and Alamari went to Portland, Maine. However, in the immediate FBI dragnet investigation into the 9-11 attacks, while no hijacker names or their flights were listed, as you might already notice with those early reports as forementioned, like with the Time Magazine website article, that there were clues looming in that authorities thought that some of the 9-11 hijackers had unauthorized, unrestricted access to the airports. But this was only significantly noticeable from reports coming out of Boston, which we've come to know long after, is a tremendous problem as far as chain of evidence being fully provided, because still after the 9-11 Commission report release in 2004, Logan Airport security CCTV video is still not released two years after in the Zacharias Massawi trial exhibit evidence, while the Dulles Airport security video for Flight 77 hijackers that struck the Pentagon are available for public access. This film will attempt to bring an answer or some closure as to why the federal government or the national security state till this day hasn't released Logan Airport security CCTV, which remains classified as top secret information. However, before we address that and the unnecessary route of travel to Maine, there are many things that need to be looked at, because on September 13th, some of the mainstream news networks were reporting this. Meanwhile, investigators here seem to have collected all the evidence that they want to from this airport. We've been told that they took some seats from some terminals to test them for DNA. Also, as we told you yesterday, there was a car that was impounded from one of the parking lots here at Logan that was connected with the hijackers. And in that car, we told you, were flight manuals in Arabic. We're also now learning from law enforcement sources that there was a ramp pass in that car, a pass, a, bo a little uh, you know, employee badge that allows people into secure areas of Logan Airport. So this is something that, is, that is, raises some questions about security here at Logan. The Boston Globe and its morning editions is uh, running a piece that says that uh, uh, two of the alleged uh, hijackers uh, who left out of Boston had uh, what is known in the uh, airline business as a ramp pass uh, or uh, can be known as a tarmac pass that allows either vehicles or individuals access out to where the planes taxi, take off, arrive, park, uh, catering, cleaning, maintenance, all of that. The other problem is, of course, that we now know that at least at one airport they had ramp uh, access. Uh, which is not surprising with, an, with a coordinated attack this big and it, for a, as easy it is to get a job at an airport. I mean, many of the jobs are minimum wage, low or no screening. We have had convictions for actually lying about uh, security agencies or uh, companies actually doing the background checks. Now, that has even been the subject of a criminal case in this country. Um, so now we know that the system is compromised from within as well. And this is a total failure of the system saying, oh, well, okay, uh, some screeners missed it, uh, or some screeners, uh, you know, weren't even required to pick it up. We have something far more serious going on than that when we find out that they have ramp passes and, and literally could have compromised the entire system. The FBI has, however, confirmed, as we said, that 10 people did board those two flights here who were responsible for the hijackings. And we also know that a ramp pass was found in the belongings of one of the hijackers. Now, a ramp pass is an access pass that grants access to restricted areas of the airport. And the Port Authority here, Massport, says uh, that of the 16,000 badges that they have out to their various employees here of, of the various companies at the airport, 800 badges are missing. So new badges are being issued to every employee of every company working here at Boston Logan. I wanted to mention another interesting development too, Pete, that Chris Hansen mentioned earlier is that a ramp pass was found inside that car that they searched at Logan Airport, which must lead authorities to believe that somehow this was partly an inside job. We know that some of the people involved in the attacks on Tuesday had ramp passes, fake IDs, and uh, perhaps fake uniforms as well. 
Aside what suspicious items were first reported to have been found in the white rental car left in the parking lot, as well as combined with what was discovered in the suitcase left at Logan, copies of the Quran, flight training manuals, and letters and instructions written in Arabic, flight uniforms and Logan ramp passes were also discovered, in which will be determined as having belonged to Muhammad Atta. But these revelations, which are later to be buried, would be sufficient evidence and an early indicator that some of the hijackers had the ability of gaining unrestricted access inside Logan Airport. Details about ramp passes and other later reports of having flight uniforms seem to disappear, as they are not part of the official story or contained within the Zacharias Massawi trial evidence exhibits. And if we're dealing with hijacking suspects who simply boarded flights just as traveling passengers, they would have been simply identifiable by each of their transactions, purchasing tickets, and being on the flight manifest. But also, as Fox News' Bill Rapley detailed, that investigators took seats from the terminals to collect DNA evidence. And this was also done by investigators for the rental cars left, looking meticulously for any items the hijackers may have left over, as DNA samples were collected under normal protocol. But you have to ask yourself, if all the hijackers simply boarded their flights with real names as passengers in what news reports were professing, uh, they not only know the number, though, they know the identities of each of the individuals and they know what specific plane they were on, which is significant to investigators because, again, uh, these people apparently d d didn't give a, a tinker's damn about trying to hide their identity. Uh, they bought their credit, they used their credit cards, bought a ticket, got in line, got on the plane, and, and here I am. There wouldn't be any reason for federal investigators to go the extra lengths of collecting departure lounge chairs to collect DNA, which begs the question as to why. That, that uh, car as well as seats from Logan Airport being gone over at an FBI processing facility, the seats being gone over, seats from the airport for possible DNA evidence of who may have been involved with this, as I say, rapidly developing situation out here at the still closed Logan Airport. But aside for additional items found in the rental car being omitted, Anta's credit card transactions on it later is presumed to have been used by Marwan al-Shehi being left at Boston, in which the white Mitsubishi rental car quickly discovered by authorities on the day of 9-11 was due to an early tip from a traveler who saw Middle Eastern men get into an altercation near the rental car, which was reported continuously by NBC News the following day and afterward. As rescuers toil, another high-stakes effort is underway to find those responsible for the carnage. NBC's Chris Hansen reports investigators are making swift progress. Authorities may have identified some of the actual hijackers, and here's how they think they might have done that. Yesterday, they got a phone call from a passenger who had left Logan and arrived at his destination. Of course, he saw on the television monitors what had happened at the World Trade Center. He called investigators to say that he had had an altercation with two men he described as being Arabic in the central parking garage near the American Airlines terminal here at Boston Logan. He described the car that they were near, which was a, turned out to be a rental car, a Mitsubishi sedan. Investigators arrived at the sedan, took a quick look, and they found inside that there were flight training manuals in Arabic. They were able to connect that sedan to two men who are now identified as brothers, both of whom who have passports from the United Arab Emirates, one of whom is a trained pilot. The quick discovery of the vehicle first subsequently put the 9-11 dragnet on the trail with Boston police raiding downtown hotels the next day on September 12th, primarily at Weston Hotel. In the afternoon, it was reported that three people were detained, two of them being females with reportedly suspicious items such as hair dye, which was thought some of the other hijacking suspects used before the attacks but that the rooms they rented at the Westin were linked to the same credit card used to rent the white car at Logan. This was the FBI uh, terrorist task force made up of FBI agents, Massachusetts state police officers, working the Logan airport leads from this, uh, from this uh, terrorist case. A paper trail led them from the Logan airport to the Westin Hotel, where they believe one individual had rented two rooms. They were very interested in looking at those rooms to discern if they could get evidence there. That would be rooms 1403 and 1404, both on the 14th floor. The FBI agents and Massachusetts State Police arrived. They got hotel security to get the keys for both rooms. As they made their approach on the 14th floor to the two rooms, suddenly three individuals came out of one of the rooms. The agents backed off, um, let the people go by them, and at the elevators they took them down. 
At that point, they say... Uh, you, you don't mean took them down the elevator, by the way. No, I mean uh, took them down as, uh, as in felony arrest style, right. put them down on the ground, um, placed them in custody, two females, one male, um, and uh, they began screaming in Arabic, according to uh, people on the scene. Plus, the bomb squad was also called out. Reports indicated that the three suspects were not arrested, but no clarity was brought if they were still detained on INS charges or other circumstances. Early reports from ABC on the scene indicated that one of them may have been injured. Well, Peter, I am outside of the Weston Copley Plaza, a 35-story hotel and shopping complex which has been evacuated, and the crowd which is gathered outside is being pushed back further and further from that uh, hotel. The bomb squad, or a bomb squad vehicle, is in front along with two ambulances. And the police here are not uh, saying anything. But in talking to uh, a number of people in the crowd, they say they saw what appeared to be a, an individual being hustled by a large number of heavily armed uh, police officers into a vehicle and driven away. Several other people said they have seen a uh, civilian taken away on a stretcher about 45 minutes ago. One person I spoke to, with the caveat, of course, that this person is not among the authorities, says he heard two police officers speaking among each other, saying that they had uh, taken into custody one suspect and that, in the words of this person, the other one was dead or wounded. And he added that uh, one of them had driven a cab for 15 years. According to the Boston Globe, September 13th, an employee at the budget car and truck rental office inside the Westin said several Arab guests at the hotel who attempted to rent a car yesterday morning were considered suspicious, prompting the call to police. However, reports the next day said they were let go, and the FBI would not comment. But Boston's WBZ4 Beth Germano extensively covering what was going on at Logan, she also reported this detail about the suspects detained from Weston Hotel. And when heavily armed agents entered the Weston Hotel yesterday, it was because of a trail of credit card receipts that may again be linked to hijackers. When the FBI and Massachusetts State Police surrounded a Chestnut Hill motel yesterday, they were looking for more evidence that terrorists may have stayed here. At least much, three Mother. people were detained in Boston and later released, though the Attorney General says there's no way of knowing yet how many associates remain at large. WBZ News has now learned that the three individuals questioned by police in Boston yesterday and released were taken into custody because they had the same last name as Mohammed Ada, the man who has reportedly emerged as a prime suspect. Police had also searched this Chestnut Hill Hotel outside of Boston, which became an official place where brother hijackers Walid and Well Al Sharia of Flight 11 stayed at. Early reports indicated that police and FBI confiscated an additional vehicle there. Even though the 9-11 Commission report says the brothers had rented a Ford Focus that was also left at Logan Airport parking lot, and no images of it have ever been made public. And in the interest of this film not to focus so much on the official flights, whether it be aeronautics, piloting, or addressing the complete hijacking scenarios, there are still a lot of issues that need to be explained as far as problems regarding hijacking roster, and the phone calls from the flights indicating weapons used that is contrary to the official version, as well as not a complete chain of evidence with no CCTV video released from Logan, all of which we'll address further ahead. But as more widely known as where two hijackers stayed on 9-10 the day before 9-11, which was out of state, aside for a couple alternate lodging choices in the Boston area before September 10th, the remaining eight hijackers are supposed to have stayed at the Milner Hotel in Beacon Hill, the Days Inn Hotel in Brighton, as well as Park Inn Hotel in Chestnut Hill. All Boston area hotels were presumably the hijackers either took rental cars or taxis to Logan Airport the next day. But the problem here is that none of the official 9-11 hijacking conspirators are said to have stayed at Weston Hotel. The official story says that Marwan El Shahi and three other hijackers shared a room at the Milner Hotel, with the other four staying at Days Inn and Park Inn Hotels. But from the news reports I've sifted through viewing the FBI dragnet extensively after 9-11, I've seen no coverage so far reporting investigators on scene at Milner Hotel nor Days Inn, at least not from the limitations of live news collections from YouTube and especially archive.org's Understanding 9-11, a television news archive, which extensively covers all the main news networks that day and following week of 9-11, included with local news channel Boston WBZ4. Brother hijackers Ahmed and Hamza Al Ghamdi of Flight 175 stayed at this day's inn, but Al Shahi is said to have stayed with three hijackers between both flights. Flight 175's Fayez bin Hamad Mohan Al Shari, who are said to have accompanied him as part of his team, 
plus Flight 11 hijacker Satam al Sakami, which is an interesting arrangement being that a few days after the attacks, it is reported that Satam al Sakami's passport was famously found at Ground Zero in what is often described as pristine condition. It's also interesting that ringleader Atta's right-hand man is often said to be fellow Hamburg cell member al Shahi, when it also seems that Atta falls into the same category of leftover evidence as al Sakami because it was reported in October of 2001 in Florida and other newspapers in that the FBI confirmed a Conch Republic passport was issued to Mohammed Atta there. And according to the book, The Star and the Sword by Wayne Madsen, this alleged passport was found in Ground Zero, making it the second hijacker passport allegedly discovered there. The Conch Republic is a micronation declared as a tongue-in-cheek secession of the city of Key West, Florida from the U.S. in 1982. However, till this day, Atta's novelty passport from there never surfaced in any of the 9-11 investigation evidentiary exhibits. But what is also unusual and makes it more suspicious with the circumstances of al Shahi staying at Milner Hotel is with something I briefly pointed out in previous film work, utilizing the mini-documentary Unsafe at Any Altitude, in that al Shahi and his fellow Flight 175 team member from the United Arab Emirates, Fayez Ben Hamad, were seen in Virginia at Dulles Airport on September 10th, the day before 9-11, along with three other Middle Eastern men, one of them being hijacker Nawaf al-Hazmi of Flight 77 that struck the Pentagon. And some of them were also dressed in United Airlines ground worker uniforms, all seen by Argenbright security employee Eric Gill, who also had a rude encounter with them as they were having troubles accessing an exit point into a restricted area open to the concourse where the airliners are parked, which as an exit point could mean that the five men just arrived from another flight. And according to the 9-11 commission report, Upon Marwan's second entry into the United States in early 2001, he spent a greater part in the beginning that year residing in Virginia. But the point being, Marwan al Shahi with Fayez Ben Hamad are supposed to be well prepared in Boston, Massachusetts the following day to board, hijack, as well as pilot United Airlines Flight 175 for all the world to see live crashing into the South Tower. And that's also a pretty long commute with a short time window to travel in between and be prepared. This possible circumstance with al Shahi and Ben Hamad, if there was more evidence to explore and not limited to Logan, may seem to be a similar fitting modus operandi as to what also Mohammed Atta and Abdelaziz Alamari's actions and unnecessary route of travel the day before is all about. But unlike Atta and Alamari, this situation with al Shahi and Ben Hamad is not part of the official story, where Atta and Alamari in Maine are. However, the official story also says that both Atta and El Shehi flew into Boston from Florida on September 9th and on September 10th. Atta pays for two rental cars there, for which this claim we will further test. One of the rental cars being the blue 2001 Nissan Altima, which will eventually be left at Jetport, Maine. Atta already picked up Al Omari already staying at Milner Hotel, or the Park Inn in Chestnut Hill, According to a Boston Globe article in 2005 about demolishing the hotel, sourcing a congressional investigation into the attacks, and additionally contrary in the same Boston Globe article, it also states that Flight 11's Al Sakami was staying with the Al Sherry brothers in room 432 at Park Inn. So as far as getting an accurate depiction of what the hijacking suspects were doing exactly in Boston the day or days before 9-11, it all depends on which original source you want to believe. And the same goes for the Flight 175 hijackers even having all stayed relatively close to one another the day before. Because as it turns out, we actually don't have a proper story about the hijackers' transactions with their plane tickets for both flights. Now investigators tonight are following the paper trail. Some of the passenger tickets purchased by the hijackers were, I'm told, bought in cash. But in one case, sources say that a single credit card was used to buy tickets for seven of the hijackers. They've also learned that seven of the airline tickets were purchased with one credit card. That is a critical piece of information, according to those investigators. We are told that the suspects apparently made no effort whatsoever to cover up their identities. We are told that some of them, one group as large as seven, purchased all of the tickets that they used to board the aircraft that they hijacked with the same credit card. Those credit card records and the flight manifest have provided the most significant details to date.
these early vague reports about seven tickets purchased on one credit card at Logan in all likelihood would have been for Flight 175 given the setting in which all alleged five hijackers are already present in Boston on the morning of September 11th, where for example of Flight 11, only three hijackers are, as Atta and Alamari have yet to land in Boston from Portland, Maine, which adding the obstacle of purchasing a ticket at Logan Airport would have made things more complicated in the short time window to board Flight 11. And it's already confirmed that Atta and Alamari had their Flight 11 tickets purchased in advance, but in addition, it's also reported that some of the other hijackers purchased their tickets in cash, which most likely could have been the three other Flight 11 hijackers. Allegedly, the five tickets for Flight 175 were also purchased in advance. However, there are some peculiar anomalies regarding four of the ticket purchase transactions. Hamza Al Ghamdi purchased his own e-ticket for Flight 175 on August 29th using his Visa card, and the following day on August 30th, he bought his brother Ahmed an identical e-ticket for the flight. But the FBI also claimed that Hamza also purchased an e-ticket for Flight 7950 from LA to San Francisco, although giving no projected date of flight. Fayez bin Hamad purchased both his and Mohan Al Sheri's first class tickets for Flight 175 online on August 27 or 29 charging an outrageous $4,464.50 to a credit card belonging to Mustafa al Hazawi, who's now in Guantanamo Bay. According to FBI Director Robert Mueller in 2002, for his statement for the record to Joint Intelligence Committee Inquiry, JIS, on the 28th of August, Marwan al Shehi went to Miami International Airport accompanied by an unknown man and purchased his September 11th ticket for Flight 175. Either all the information regarding these airline ticket purchases from hijackers is accurate and true, or the feds may have been ordered, for some given reason, to cover up or possibly alter evidence claiming these transactions occurred as they did. Given if all Flight 175 tickets were actually purchased on one credit card, therefore giving room for two more additional hijackers unaccounted for if there were seven tickets purchased for the flight. However, given those reports already from September 12th, detailing such a transaction early in the investigation, for all we know, could also be for a completely different flight at Logan. And additionally, in the aforementioned Boston Globe article from September 13th, the surnames of 12 Arabic men were the focus by investigators then, specifically detailing that a dozen names were being pieced together from Boston Logan between the two flights, not 10 hijackers like the official story. But going back to passports being found at Ground Zero, regardless if Atta's novelty Conk Republic passport isn't part of the official story, therefore isn't available to compare conditions with Satam al Sakambi's passport being found, because with those unusual circumstances and holes in the stories of their whereabouts, for all we know, it's possible both passports may have well been planted at Ground Zero. And it is a valid claim when such items as paper passports can be found at Ground Zero, but not any of the four black boxes from Flights 11 and 175. This is Ground Zero worker Mike Malone, who was recognized for his heroic efforts in the recovery and cleanup. He appeared on the 9-11 episode for Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura in 2009, and confessed that he saw one of the black boxes get recovered within the first three weeks of Ground Zero cleanup, and that later, it was confirmed to him by other fellow co-workers that two more boxes were found, making it a total of three being found by Malone and Associates quite a revelation, because you then have to wonder why the FBI would cover up or withhold such physical evidence. But throughout the episode, Jesse Ventura eventually starts to puzzle things as to why the feds have hidden the black boxes, and his best lead ironically comes from Mike Malone himself, because he happens to also know a former air traffic controller from Logan Airport and others who work with American Airlines. Throughout the course of the episode, Malone's acquaintances from Boston Logan and the airlines were reluctant to do an interview for Jesse and refused to be on camera. But towards the end of the episode, Malone reveals to Jesse and Braverman what his acquaintances working at Logan and American Airlines knew about Flight 11 on September 11th. Mike Malone told us a real mind blower. He said the airline people said the hijackers were in the cockpit of American Airlines while it was still on the runway, before it even took off. Malone says that somebody on the ground knew hijacker was in the cockpit and somebody else on the ground let that plane take off. Which if we're going to stick to the official story, that would mean that pilot hijacker Atta was in the cockpit behind the controls before departure, regardless of this suggests he wouldn't have simply boarded as a passenger. 
because the claim that the hijackers were in the cockpit during Flight 11's and even possibly Flight 175's departures can be backed up by the tracking of the flight's original path, which was already pointed out specifically on the day of 9-11, which neither of the two Logan flights were going the correct route right after takeoff. As this news piece that day even pointed out, on the evening of 9-11, on local New York Fox Channel 5. And uh, what I did was I went down to my office and I picked up uh, one of these uh, flight charts that uh, all pilots use. This is a high altitude flight chart. And I looked up the route of flight that these planes out of Boston would be flying to Los Angeles. And it's actually further off course than uh, we were originally speaking because the, the route of flight should have taken uh, both of those aircraft out of Boston up over southern New Hampshire up over southern Vermont, then over Syracuse, New York, Buffalo, and, and then out over Michigan before turning uh, a little more southwestward to go to uh, Los Angeles. So, uh, which leads speculation to a couple of things. One, you could say then that this uh, hijacking occurred probably right after takeoff, because as we were also talking earlier, when the way these aircraft are programmed to fly, the flight crews put in that assigned flight plan uh, prior to leaving the gate. And once they take off from their departure airport, they usually hit the computer button at about a thousand feet and the autopilot really flies it the rest of the way. So would the control tower know immediately that the plane was not on, on target? Yes, because the first clearance would have been for, this, for these airplanes to fly to Manchester, New Hampshire. That's what's called their first fix or their first navigational point that they should cross over. And uh, Manchester, New Hampshire is the opposite direction to New York City. So from that standpoint, that leads me to believe that the hijacking occurred immediately after takeoff. Not that this is actual evidence to prove Atta was not a pilot or hijacker on Flight 11, but it certainly counters the official claim that if he did pilot it, he did so not by gaining access as a regular traveler. There is a theory uh, being debated right now uh, based on what Attorney General John Ashcroft said yesterday that, that each one of these planes had anywhere from three to six people on board involved with a the hijacking. There is a theory that it's possible that a number of these men didn't even know each other and that they waited on board before they were given some sort of signal to, to commandeer the jet. Can you provide any more information on that this morning? Yes, I can. I've spoken to law enforcement investigators, some of the investigators, and they say they are uh, looking increasingly at the likelihood that the, the two pilots would have known each other. But then when they got aboard these planes, that then there was another group of about three individuals who they did not know, who came from other cells, they are calling them. And uh, those individuals then, through some signal, either it was those individuals who gave a signal to the pilots, through some overt action, at which point everyone knew that they should get up and start their jobs, that they had all been tasked to individual jobs. And it certainly opens a lot of questions, which will be addressed real soon. According to the official story, Flight 11 gets hijacked 15 minutes after departure at 8.14 a.m. over central Massachusetts, turning first northwest, then south, and that Flight 175 was hijacked between 8.42 a.m. and 8.46 a.m., approximately making it either 22 to 26 minutes after its takeoff, which makes it a rather glaring anomaly according to what the normal flight route is departing out of Logan, exiting up over southern New Hampshire, and not turning out away from the normal air traffic all of a sudden which as Fox 5's newscaster Mike Gregory stated, this would be an indication both flights were hijacked immediately after departure, especially also with the second plane, Flight 175, which also had three near-mid-air collisions. One around 8.51 a.m. when changing altitude, it nearly missed Delta Airlines Flight 2315 flying from Hartford to Tampa. And according to author Len Spencer in her book from 2008, Touching History, the untold story of the drama that unfolded in the skies over America on 9-11. Moments before Flight 175 crashed, it avoided another near collision with Midwest Express Flight 7, which departed Milwaukee and was heading to LaGuardia Airport in New York. And another one that's lesser known was TWA Flight Number 3, which took off from JFK Airport in New York, destined for St. Louis, in which ABC News was able to report it towards the evening of September 11th, having interviewed the pilot and some of the passengers. You dodged one of the aircraft yeah. that hit the tower? Well, he was, he was up there whenever we were coming from New York, so what we had to do was they were not talking to him, and he was changing his heading and his altitude, so they just cleared us to deviate however we had to to stay away from him. It was right after they had taken off, and the passengers were horrified. I thought we were going to crash. I thought the plane was going to crash, because when we took off, the plane kind of went down and came back up, kind of, kind of, it was, it was kind of shaking. 
and it wasn't your normal taking off routine. And then you could just see like a plane that just kind of just bypassed us really close. And I, and I said, maybe it was just a mere miss. But according to the phone calls made from Flight 175, passengers Peter Hanton and Brian David Sweeney made phone calls from the GTE air phones in the rear of the aircraft. Airphone records also indicate that Garnett Bailey made four phone call attempts to his wife, but never connected. On the flight phone call chart from the Zacharias Masawi trial exhibit, says that two unnamed flight attendants made five calls from row 31 on seats C, D, E, F, and G. However, when you click to each flight attendant, it only shows the same three calls for each one. The first only lasted 75 seconds, and the following one lasted 31 seconds. According to Wikipedia, it also says that flight attendant Robert Fangman made a call. Phone calls from the passengers would indicate that the hijackers pushed the passengers and flight crew to the back of the plane, having already stabbed and killed other passengers, and possibly the pilots, that they had knives, mace, and made a threat of having a bomb. In Peter Hansen's last call to his father, he stated that he thought the hijackers intended to go to Chicago or someplace and fly it into a building. But as far as weapons used on Flight 11, according to the details conveyed about the hijacking through phone calls by two stewardesses, Knives and mace were also used, as well as the appearance of a bomb or explosives. But specifically, a gun was also used, which it's believed that passenger Daniel Lewin was shot instead of stabbed. As reported in the Village Voice in 2005, the FAA issued an executive summary of what went on board Flight 11. The report read, The American Airlines FAA Principal Security Inspector, PSI, was notified by Susan Clark of American Airlines Corporate Headquarters that an onboard flight attendant contacted American Airlines Operations Center and informed them that a passenger in seat 10B had shot and killed a passenger in seat 9B at 9.20 a.m. The passenger killed was Daniel Lewin, shot by passenger Satam al Sakambi. One bullet was reported to have been fired. The 9-11 commissioners on staff statement number 4 the four flights admitted that from the crash sites of all four official planes in the attacks of September 11th, that regardless of the anomalies outside the proposed theory of box cutters conveyed by flight attendants and passengers, such as with mace, knife, and bombs, that there's no way of proving either case being used, but that it seems unlikely that one of the teams would depart from the tactical discipline of the plotter's mutual strategy. But mainly for firearms used on Flight 11, it states... Finally, though it appears erroneous at this point in the investigation, staff continues to develop information on how the gun story may have come to be reported. Again, we stress our investigative work, including on the issues we have discussed today, is by no means complete. Our investigation continues. Only two people are recognized as having made calls, which were both flight attendants Betty Ong and Madeline Amy Sweeney. On the Masawi exhibit flight phone call chart, four other calls are made by unknown passengers that provide no phone or seat numbers or how long the calls were made. Sweeney made five calls and Ong made one call that was recorded and 27 minutes long, with long gaps of silence due to Ong breaking concentration with what was unraveling on board. Portions of Ong's call were frequently demonstrated on the news later, which indicates that the phone was connected all the way to the point of impact into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. During her call, which also connected to American Airlines Operations Center, Ong provided information about lack of communication with the cockpit, lack of access to the cockpit, and passenger injuries. Okay, my name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on flight 11. Okay. And the cockpit is not answering the phone. And there's somebody staff in business class, and there's, we can't breathe in business class. Somebody's got mace or something. Can you describe the person that you said someone is what in business class? Um, I'm, I'm sitting in the back. Somebody's coming back from business. If you can hold on for one second, they're coming back. Do you want to know who is being staff? I don't know, but here is it. They got staff. Okay. Our, our number one is got staff. Uh, our person is staff. Um, nobody knows who's that too, and we, we can't even get up to business class right now because nobody can breathe. Uh, our number one is, is staffed right now. Okay. And, and, uh, and our we... number five, our first class passengers, our uh, first class uh, galley flight attendant, and our purser is in staff. And we can't get up to the cockpit, the door won't open. Hello? More important to point out is that the audio recording of this call has been publicly released but is edited. 
but the follow-up recording to American Airlines emergency line by Nidia Gonzalez of American Airlines at the Rally Reservation Center, who had Ong on the phone, conveyed that Ong at least detailed two hijackers by seat numbers in first class, that they were sitting in 2A and B. But stewardess Madeline Amy Sweeney read off four passenger seat numbers as hijackers and also stated they had a bomb. According to parts of the transcript reported by Gail Sheehy of the New York Observer February 16, 2004, in stewardess ID'd hijackers early, transcripts show, Amy, this is Michael Woodward. The American Airlines flight service manager had been friends with Sweeney for a decade, so he didn't have to waste any time verifying that this wasn't a hoax. Michael, this plane has been hijacked. Miss Sweeney repeated, calmly, she gave him the seat locations of three of the hijackers, 9D, 9G, and 10B. She said they were all Middle Eastern descent, and one spoke English very well. Sweeney indicates that she thinks there were only three hijackers on Flight 11, telling James Sayer, a staff assistant, that the hijackers were in seats 9C, 9G, and 10B. Later transcripts indicate the changes on the seat numbering, including an additional fourth seat. 9D, although eventually a seat gets allocated for ATA, according to the FBI document, T7B10 FBI 302s, Olson FDR 302s, Michael Woodward 372, page 5, from 9-11-2001, the hijackers were sitting in seats 10B, 9C, and 9G, or 9D and 9G. Sweeney described the hijackers as three Middle Eastern males. One of the males spoke good English, and another spoke poor English. There was never any mention of a fourth or fifth hijacker, especially for the unusual scenario that was going on during the hijacking between the stewardess's ongoing lack of communication to the cockpit. However, apart from seat 10B, these seat numbers are different from those registered in the hijackers' names. The five hijackers on Flight 11 had been in seats 2A, 2B, 8D, 8G, and 10B, according to the 9-11 Commission report. Of course, We already know they released flight manifest for 19 hijacker names from the four flights on September 14th, and there were anomalies of not having the entire set of passenger and seat numbers provided per hijacking suspect. But more significantly in anomalies and inconsistencies is previously in the estimation of hijackers per plane, when it was only stated as 18 hijackers on September 13th. And if all the hijackers boarded as the official story says, just as normal passengers but with weapons, There should be no dilemma to get a proper roster of hijacking conspirators per plane announced the following day, September 12th, by FBI and Attorney General, so long as the terrorist hijackers use their real names as proclaimed. And uh, there is a possibility some hijackers pose as pilots to gain access uh, to cockpits. And when considering the false identities that authorities allowed the news media to start showing by September 15th and were detracting days after, is a likely indication authorities covered up how some of the hijacking suspects gain unrestricted access from both flights at Logan, even disguised as airline employees. Because logically, the FBI would have had Logan security CCTV video recordings in possession that would have included angles filming boarding gates of flights 11 and 175, simply capturing all 10 hijackers boarding as passengers. And it also really made no sense how could they show mistaken photos of hijackers when they should have been able to simply compare them from Logan. And even cases of mistakes done to Flight 93 at Newark Airport. But this is not what we are seeing as far as the correct flight manifest, especially not by September 14th as ABC News demonstrates models of the hijacked airliners showing Flight 11 corroborating with at least flight attendant Madeline Amy Sweeney's phone call where she read off only four hijackers riding as passengers assigned by seat numbers. But long since 9-11, they eventually released the entire passenger manifest, in which with the aforementioned misreportings and anomalies, are definitely a reason to be skeptical over whether the list is authentic or outright altered, for whatever reason one might imagine, that even authorities might have not been able to reveal or properly detect all hijacking conspirators boarding each flight. In other words, by the hijacking operations themselves, It's conceivable that perhaps not even the government knows what happened on 9-11. And up ahead, there will be more to examine about the hijackers being seen at Logan Airport before 9-11 as well, supporting previous cases of unrestricted access, as there had never been any American airline ticket agents from September 11th at Logan who recall or confess to having serviced ATA or any of the Flight 11 hijackers. But there seems to be one employee who recalls seeing ATA, Lynn Marie Florence Howland, 
first officer of American Airlines, who was interviewed by the FBI according to a declassified document T7B11 FBI 302's Cockpit and American Hijacker FDR, page 14. Hallen explained that she departed Logan to San Francisco on the morning of September 10th. She returned back to Logan Airport on American Airlines Flight 198, arriving approximately at 6.50 a.m. on the morning of 9-11. After being in and out of state flying for several days for her job, she was extremely tired returning back to Boston, but she had taken notes of her schedule, charting what she did as she flew as first officer with Captain Douglas Bailman from SF to Boston. She was certain of the arrival gate for her Flight 198, and subsequently checked with American Airlines Dispatch, who later told her mistakenly that her Flight 198 became the hijacked Flight 11. After almost everyone had deplaned, she went up to the jetway ahead of Captain Bailman. She stated she was standing near the entrance of the jetway in the passenger lounge. A male individual comes up to her suddenly and asks if she is going to take this plane out, referring to the flight she just brought in. She said no, and he abruptly turned away and went and sat down. She thought it was extremely rude. Her first impression was that he was a pilot going to fly in the jump seat. While he wasn't in uniform, he may have been wearing a pilot-type shirt, open collar. She thought he may have had a rolling pilot flight kit or bag with him, which she described as a black vinyl, round top, and incredibly cheap. Again, she could not recall anything else, only at the time wanting to get to the hotel and sleep. She said she was so tired, when she got to her hotel room, she crashed in bed in her uniform. She woke up about 1 p.m. and then found out about the terrorist attacks. She said for the longest time she wasn't even sure that she was dreaming it at all. Until she saw photographs of the hijackers in the news, she was instantly sure that the individual she saw that morning was a suspected hijacker, Mohammed Atta. She added that when she first saw the pictures of the hijackers in the news media, it was like an electric shock when she saw the picture of Atta. Besides Lynn Hallen and actually not being on the day of 9-11, but actually a familiar turf, according to another similar document, T-7B-11 FBI 302's Ground Security Coordinator FDR FBI 302, entire contents, 424, page 10. There's the case of Diane Graney, second witness with recollections of Atta, who worked at Portland Jetport and on 9-11, where she didn't see any of the hijackers that morning, but recognized Atta's face from the press photo, that was published in the aftermath, she is positive that Atta, dressed in an American Airlines uniform and able to identify himself as an American Airlines pilot, tried prior to 9-11 to achieve a jump seat on a U.S. Airways flight. She saw Atta's picture on the news. She believed she had seen him before. She thought he may have tried to jump seat once with U.S. Air and he was in uniform using an American Airlines pilot identification. She believed that this happened within the last six months. She advised she search the U.S. Air jump seat paperwork to see who had gone through for June 2001, July 2001, and August 2001, but was unable to find Atta's name. She advised the jump seat forms are only kept for 90 days. Of course, Atta and his confidant, Abdulaziz Al-Amari, would be returning to Jetport there on the early morning of 9-11, departing for Boston to catch Flight 11. And there are lots of witness accounts throughout Portland and the state of Maine having seen Atta vividly, which we are about to address ahead. But compare this to the particulars provided by Lynn Howard. According to her, Atta was wearing a white pilot type or Oxford shirt, no tie, and blue pilot type slacks, and carried a really cheap pilot bag. Furthermore, Atta approached her and asked if she was going to fly American 11. Apparently, he wanted a jump seat on the flight. But it gets even better on September 10th, 2016. Forbes put out an article, Delta Captain Recalls Flying with Terror Mastermind Just Before 9-11 about former Delta Airlines captain Pat Gilmore, who recalls Atta in the jump seat not long before 9-11. It says, Mohammed Atta wore an American Airlines pilot uniform as he rode in the cockpit with Baltimore to Atlanta. He was about seven weeks before September 11 terror attacks, and, according to the captain of the Delta Airlines Flight 2210, the 9-11 ringleader cast a pal over the flight deck. He gave me a stare in the cockpit at cruise altitude that was bone-chilling, said Pat Gilmore. The stare went right through me. It was the same stare that I saw in law enforcement photos. Gilmore, the captain of that Boeing 757 flight on July 26, 2001, never has told his story publicly. His memory conflicts with an FBI timeline of the 9-11 assault. 
but Gilmore insists on his narrative and describes it in great detail. He is just one of several witnesses who say they saw the mastermind of the attacks on New York and Washington while the clock ticked toward the largest terrorist attack in U.S. history. Atta, an Egyptian national, and the apparent leader of 19 hijackers who commandeered the four passenger jets, showed Gilmore's seemingly legitimate American Airlines identification, Gilmore says. Gilmore says that Atta showed him a standard pilot's Federal Aviation Administration Class 1 medical certificate and a jump seat request form that pilots typically present when riding as cockpit passengers on their own or competing airlines. These documents bore the name Atta and his picture was on the company ID, Gilmore told the American Media Institute. Gilmore, now retired, insisted that Atta was on flight 2210, though an FBI timeline has Atta flying from Fort Lauderdale to Newark during that interval, the Bureau's document contains various discrepancies and Gilmore cannot forget the face of the operation's primary attacker. Now, as you might imagine, given with the previous anomalies communicating with Flight 11, an American Airlines first officer, Lynn Marie Florence Howland, returning at Logan, already mentioned that these jump seat riding revelations would certainly mean that the authorities have completely covered up and lied about the fact of how Flight 11 was taken over, and that Mohammed Atta did not board as a normal passenger, therefore having unrestricted access of Logan. One can only imagine what Atta could have used to subdue the American Airlines pilots, John Oganowski and Thomas McGinnis. But even though this may seem to be good enough identifiable evidence proving Atta hijacked Flight 11 from Logan, you might want to consider what Forbes details about Gilmore's account contradicting the FBI timeline with Atta flying from Florida to New Jersey during that time interval, and especially also consider what Atta's father in Egypt said on September 18th and asked the question, just exactly which Atta hijacked Flight 11? But there seems to be an interesting activity of Atta a year prior through Germany and Europe as the alleged Prague connection between Iraq and Al-Qaeda came through an alleged meeting between Mohammed Atta at the Iraqi consulate in April of 2001. Until late 2004, many believed Atta traveled to Prague for one day on May 30, 2000. Nobody claimed he met Ahmed Samir al-Ani, the council of the Iraqi embassy in Prague, at a cafe there at that time except for conservative columnist Andrew C. McCarthy who wrote in the National Review that his trip was considered suspicious. Atta was apparently detained because he did not have a travel visa, but was not picked up on airport surveillance. However, the Chicago Tribune reported in August 2004 that it was a different Atta who traveled to Prague in May 2000. A Pakistani businessman also named Mohammed Atta, who spells his name differently from the official hijacker and was turned away because he lacked a visa. The hijacker Mohammed Atta, whose travel papers were in order, went to the Prague airport a couple of days later on his way to Newark, creating confusion some more. Brian Whitmore, Boston Globe correspondent, stated at the end of his article September 19, 2004, a 9-11 legacy, confusion over a name checks fine error in tracking Atta. On June 2nd, the hijacker Mohammed Atta, who had a visa, arrived in Prague by bus from Cologne, Germany, and flew to Newark the next day. Video surveillance cameras at a Prague bus terminal showed him playing slot machines at the station's Happy Days Casino before disappearing. The confusion over the two different Atas had serious consequences, according to Czech reporter Brian Canetti, as it laid the groundwork for suspicious claims by Czech authorities of a secret meeting in Prague between Atta, the hijacker, and an Iraqi intelligence agent. The Chicago Tribune on August 29, 2004, reported that a man from Pakistan named Mohammed Atta, spelling his name with two M's rather than one, flew to the Czech Republic in 2000, confusing the intelligence agency who thought it was the same Mohammed Atta, according to Jari Ruzek, the former head of the BIS, in the Czech newspaper Mlada Fronta Dinez, September 3, 2004. This information was verified and it was confirmed that it was the case of the same name. That is all that I recall of it. Opposition leaders in the Czech Republic have publicly called this a failure on the part of Czech intelligence. It's interesting that according to the official story, Atta is supposed to have first moved to the U.S. in the summer of 2000, but according to a book by Jürgen Roth, described as one of Germany's top investigative reporters, that in February of 2001, Mohammed Atta and two associates, one of them being a Pakistani Air Force pilot, applied for a job with Lufthansa Airlines at the Frankfurt Airport in Germany, which would give him access to secure areas of that airport, but apparently none of them are able to get the job. 
How is Atta supposed to be the ringleader, operating, or mastermind of the 9-11 conspiracy in the US when he's applying for a job in Germany which will require residing there? But there is another possibility that there may have been two different Mohammed Atta's within the United States and during the time of the attacks, and there are anomalies to support it, other than with the potential of the unusual route of travel through Maine. CNN reported May 22, 2002, that sources claimed that Atta and al Amari may have been in New York City on September 10th to make a final visit to the World Trade Center to program the tower's location into a global positioning system. The article also indicates that there were 27 credit cards traced to the 19 hijackers and that at least four GPS devices may have been pre-purchased for each targeted hijacked flight. But a much more conclusive example of another Atta being at a different place comes from early reports covering the trails of the Dragnet investigation in the state of Maryland. And ABC 7 News has learned that residents of the nearby Valencia Motel late yesterday identified in an FBI photo lineup this man, Mohammed Atta, the suspected terrorist leader. They say he was one of five suspicious men staying in this room until last Monday morning. Every night they be coming out, they sketch, have a long sheet of paper, making sketches. It looked like they were planning. Yeah, planning, right. If the idea of Muhammad Atta is accurate and he was here, the significance to the investigation would be enormous because taken with the hotel records, it would mean that the hijackers of three of the flights were in this one town. In Laurel, Brad Bell, ABC 7 News. This report from September 18th on ABC WJLA seems to indicate that Atta was witnessed being at a motel room in Maryland up until Monday on September 10th, which would have made it impossible for him to have been in Boston simultaneously already in preparation with two rental cars, about to drive off the unnecessary route to Portland with Alamari, as what the official story says, or what publications say now as with the Boston Sun in 2006. Maryland was among last stops for hijackers. Before they crashed seized planes and changed the world, the September 11th terrorists, at least seven of the 19, lived out their last days in Maryland, lifting weights, washing clothes, looking at pornography, buying groceries, and polishing their flying skills. Five left the state September 10, spending a final night in Virginia before boarding American Airlines Flight 77 at Dulles Airport and crashing into the Pentagon. One departed September 9, drove to Newark, New Jersey, and got on United Airlines Flight 93, which crashed into rural Pennsylvania after a struggle between passengers and hijackers. Mohammed Atta, the ringleader, flew in on September 7 and flew out September 9. However, until the some clarity brought about these reports in Maryland, there is still the potential of a second Atta, as it also says that when he flew from Baltimore to Boston, he went to go meet Marwan El Shehi where the two spent the night together at the Milner Hotel in downtown Boston. Three weeks ago, Otta used the American Airlines website to buy a one-way business class ticket on Flight 11. And tonight, we now know in the two days preceding the fatal flight that Otta, or someone using his credit card, not only traveled through South Florida in Portland, Maine, but Dateline has learned that he also visited Baltimore, Maryland. Investigators are trying to determine the significance of that stopover or any connection it has to another person with the same last name on the FBI's watch list. But that official Boston rendezvous scenario with Atta and Al Shehi on September 9th is already a time window being challenged starting from Florida, as it's widely known that the staff from Shuckham's Oyster Pub and Seafood Grill in Hollywood, Florida, claim they recognize Marwan and Atta drawing attention to themselves, having been in the restaurant on Saturday, September 8, 2001, the day before Marwan is supposed to fly to Boston, and as we pointed out earlier, Argenbright employee Eric Gill, working at Dulles Airport in Virginia, just outside of Maryland, had an encounter with El Shehi and fellow Flight 175 hijacker Ben Hamad at some point on September 10th. But regarding Atta, there's still many unanswered questions about September 10th which is what we're about to try to find answers for, where authorities haven't provided anything reasonable or are ever really forthcoming, as far as what Atta and Alamari really traveled to Maine for, other than presumably to lessen their exposure through airport security at Logan, which makes no sense either. And then on the day after 9-11, there is also the question regarding additional and unaccounted for conspirators staying at Boston area hotels who were at least detained, particularly at Weston Compley. But going back to ABC News with Brian Ross also reporting on September 12th, he reported this. Also today, authorities were tracking another set of six hijackers. 
who were believed to have entered the country from Canada at a small border crossing in Jackman, Maine. The men are then believed to have flown into Boston on commuter flights yesterday morning. Sources telling CNN that two of the hijackers apparently crossed from Nova Scotia, Canada by ferry to the port of Bar Harbor in the state of Maine. Well, authorities telling the CBC today that uh, they're working in uh, Jackman, Maine, which is a uh, small border crossing between uh, Nova Scotia and Maine, and also at the Yarmouth area, and uh, they've requested uh, the manifests of the ferry that runs from Yarmouth to Portland, Maine. Peter, there are few comments, no details. All Canadian authorities will say is yes, they are investigating. In Halifax, a car meticulously stripped and dusted. But the RCMP will not discuss the search for a Canadian connection. And another rental car belonging to other suspects was found at a jet port in Portland, Maine. And that car may be the key to all the speculation about a Canadian connection. Basically, with all the indications of these reports, Atta and Al Amari must have at some point rendezvoused with other operatives that came in from Canadian borders by way of northwest through Jackman, Maine, and then northeast from Bangor and Bar Harbor, originating from Nova Scotia by ferry, where there's also another rental car Canadian authorities were searching at the Halifax airport. But again, with ABC's Brian Ross reporting on September 12th, first announcing Atta's name publicly, he had also detailed this earlier. Yesterday, the police chief in uh, Portland, Maine, has told us that five men came across the border in uh, Jackman, Maine, uh, they all tried to board a commuter flight out of uh, Bangor, but there was only room for uh, three of them. Uh, the two others went on to uh, Portland. Uh, they reportedly boarded a U.S. air commuter at 5.53 yesterday morning to make the connection in Boston. We're not clear whether it was the connection to the American flight or yeah. the United flight, but it's clear that uh, they came in from Canada just before uh, this flight. In the Associated Press, written by David Sharp on September 13th, it states that not only did the FBI also sought passenger manifests from two ferries that travel between Nova Scotia and Maine, the Scotia Prince in Portland, and the Cat in Bar Harbor. So it seems that Atta and Alamari potentially were able to meet with additional suspects coming from Canada directly into Portland, Maine, by way of one ferry boat, rather than all the way up in the northern part of the state in Bar Harbor and Bangor. But the Associated Press article additionally states that the FBI were also focusing its attention on a cell phone company in Bangor, Maine, where agents interviewed employees at Unicell's corporate office on Union Street next to the Bangor Airport. The vice president of Unicell stated that the FBI agents were interested in knowing more about several men who attempted to buy cell phones recently. In a New York Times article titled, After the Attacks, the Hijackers, FBI Traces Path of Five in New England from September 13, 2001, written by James C. McKinley, Jr. and Kate Zernick, it states, Federal agents questioned employees at a store in Bangor, where five Arab men believed to be hijackers tried to rent or buy cell phones late last week, when the employees refused to sell phones because the men lacked proper identification and were not main residents. The men displayed a large amount of cash, but the employees did not accept an offer from the men to buy the phones for $3,000. The men then phoned the Bangor Airport trying to get a flight to Boston, but were told there was no flight that matched their desired departure time, the authorities said. The men then phoned Portland International Jetport, where two of them apparently made reservations for a flight to Boston on Tuesday morning. But these reports do not corroborate an Atta and Alamari driving the rental car all the way up to Bangor, Maine on September 10th as if they had potentially met up with additional conspirators crossing over from Canada from either directions on the eve of 9-11. Because, as the New York Times article details, the attempt to rent or purchase cell phones happened late last week. Plus, others may have crossed in from a second border entrance by land from Canada to Maine through the town of Calais, according to Bangor Daily News September 13, 2001, in that additionally, there was also a red pickup truck with New York plates found next to a store there, which was reported as suspicious and possibly being connected to the attacks. But a month later, also in the Bangor Daily News on October 13th, bringing even more clarity in an article by Doug Kessley, question of Bangor link to attacks unanswered. 
that three area taxicab drivers say they provided rides to people they believe to be hijackers 10 days before the attack. A cab driver named Laura Monteith said she picked up three men at about 12.45 a.m. outside Jimmy V's, a banger bar and restaurant. She said she can't forget the face or words of the man who sat in the front seat with her. Shown separate pictures of the hijackers, she identified Mohammed Ada. She also identified one of them as Flight 175 hijacker Fayez Ben Hamad. Monteith also said that the third passenger in the back didn't have the Middle Eastern appearance of the other two. She said he was tall and lanky with blonde hair and glasses and was wearing tan dress slacks, a tan shirt, and a thin brown jacket. Another cab driver, Tom Sullivan, said that the day before the terrorist attacks, he took several men resembling the terrorists to Staples at the airport mall in Bangor and later dropped them off at the Bangor Mall. And a third cab driver, who did not want to be identified, said that on Saturday, September 8, he brought four men he now believes were among the terrorists to Ames Department Store at the airport mall. He said that they were in a rush to make a 4.30 p.m. flight and quickly bought seven or eight suitcases. But separate from these reports with the known hijackers Atta, al Amari, and Ben Hamad previous to 9-11, these circumstances regarding operatives crossing over Canadian border and at Bangor, Maine, was also picked up by Robert Russo of the Canadian Press in a headline titled, FBI Searches for Canadian Link, where it mentions that former Chief of Counterintelligence for the CIA, Vincent Canestrero, told Montreal Gazette, that U.S. investigators knew that five men recently entered Maine from Canada via ferry boats from Yarmouth and or remote border station near Jackman, and also confirming three of them from Bangor Airport. Boarded a feeder plane, but only three of them could get on board because it was full, and the other two went to Portland and got a flight from Portland, which could likely mean several possible scenarios for the additional potential hijackers unable to depart from Bangor Airport. Since it clearly states that five of them came over from Canada, and it's known that Atta and Alamari both drove up to Maine from Boston in a rental car and would have likely already had their reservations set at Jetport. And as previously mentioned before, they arrived and check in to Comfort Inn at 5.43 p.m. And from the other security surveillance video capturing them in what seems to be shopping and running errands throughout Portland, there is also the possibility they could have been accompanied with others, judging from the exchange at the gas station where they are frequently looking outside the direction of their parked rental car, and that the images of them inside Walmart are a select few, possibly cherry-picked. It's hard to determine if they were accompanied by anyone else while in Portland, considering the limited security video that's been released of them at a bank teller and shopping in stores, particularly when other security videos in the Portland vicinity through town are also cherry-picked. According to the 2002 documentary, Portrait of a Terrorist, Mohammed Atta, he and Al Amari also go to this drive-up bank teller and are captured on security video, but it's neither released publicly. In fact, according to the Syracuse Post Standard from September 21st, listing an Associated Press article, stated that the FBI received surveillance tapes on September 13th from the Kittery Trading Post in Kittery, Maine, just outside the border of New Hampshire, well before Portland in which two men described to be Atta and Alamari were allegedly inside the store inquiring about knives and rubber bullets on September 10th. Which again, the security surveillance video hasn't been made public either. But it does certainly seem like part of Atta's and Alamari's mission was to rendezvous with other operatives who crossed over from Canada from at least three different directions, and that there's this additional unaccounted for rental car at the Canadian side of the border at Halifax Airport that government authorities were thoroughly investigating as part of the 9-11 attacks. We'll get into discovering what likely activity those other rendezvousing suspects were supposed to be involved in. A couple of other strands of many here. The Portland Press Herald reporting today uh, that in Portland, Maine, one of the hijackers, it is reported, had lived for at least a year and may have had a relationship, in fact, with a local woman. The Portland Press Herald article that CNN's Bill Delaney is referencing about a local woman in a relationship with one of the hijackers was thought to be Abdelaziz Alamari. But then the Boston Herald corrected the story in the article, Law Enforcement Officer Still Sifting Through Tips. On Friday, the Portland Press Herald reported that a 31-year-old woman may have had a relationship with one of the terrorists. But it turns out the man was not one of the two terrorists, the newspaper reported Saturday. Tips from a University of Southern Maine student and a woman led police to investigate a man who allegedly kept a gun under his pillow, claimed to be a terrorist, and left a month before the attacks, Portland Police Chief Michael Chitwood said. Portland detectives could find no connection between the man and the two suspects, and they turned their findings over to the FBI, he said. The man, who said he was moving to California, aroused suspicions because he claimed to be a terrorist from Turkey, 
stayed at various motels in Portland, and always had money despite not holding a job, Chitwood said. In 2014, National Geographic put out 9:10, The Final Hours, which is intended to be a moment-by-moment -moment dissection of the day before 9-11, entwined with the day's activities of the terrorists plotting the attacks, but it does provide some potential clues in the reports of Canadian connections with additional conspirators covered up. For the first time in 9-11 documentary filmmaking, National Geographic with 9-10 The Final Hours go the extra lengths of briefly interviewing actual people in Portland, Maine who had either encountered or witnessed Atta and Alamari's presence there, such as the employees at the pizzeria, hotel, travelers and employees at Jetport. Although the people who worked at the hotel and pizzeria didn't want to show themselves on camera still in 2014, in the New York Post article dated October 12, 2001, final hours of hijack monster, he waited until last minute to buy box cutters. There were reports the two were sighted at two nearby restaurants, a Pizza Hut and a Weather Vane seafood restaurant between 7 and 8.30 p.m. Workers at the Pizza Hut were still jumpy. We've got to try to run a business here, the restaurant's manager said. A waitress at Weathervane said two Middle Eastern-looking men, one who resembled Atta, dined at the restaurant that night and asked for the details of how the fish and chicken were cooked. Sue Paquette, a spokesman for Weathervane, said the two men may have been part of a group of five Muslim men, wearing traditional Middle Eastern dress, including turbans, who dined at the restaurant two nights before on Saturday. The group of five men made an effort to be gregarious and friendly, she said. Unfortunately, the staff haven't been able to say for sure whether any of the men were involved in the hijack, she said. Besides the aforementioned regarding Banger, Maine and other details within the New York Post article, lots of Portland, Maine locals remember seeing Atta several times in the coming months and weeks before the attacks, while employees at the establishments that serviced the hijackers previously were told by feds to be quiet about what they saw. But that group of five Middle Eastern men potentially sounds as this could be some of the additional or leftover suspects already coming in from Canada a week prior or within the days right before the attacks by ferries or border crossings, and that they could be remainders who didn't take the feeder plane from Bangor Airport, but traveled from there to preset themselves in Portland, Maine days before the attacks, rendezvousing with Atta and Alamari. In a September 9, 2003 article, It's Been a Loss of a Lifetime by Josie Hong, writer for Portland Press Herald, covers the story of the Comfort Inn general manager, Laura R. Whale, and that the consequence of troubles and turmoils from September 11th personally affecting her life, and that she had some very interesting questions regarding the FBI's actions on tracking down Atta and Alamari. Two years after the attack, Whale felt like she was a victim of the terrorists. She believes her connection to September 11th and the stress of dealing with the federal investigators, the national media, and her company sent her life into a tailspin. In the article, it states that she sounds impatient, agitated, that her story veers off into conspiracy theories? How did government agents know to storm the Comfort Inn only hours after the Twin Towers fell? Why did the FBI release surveillance video of Atta and Alamari at various locations in South Portland, but not the lobby of the Comfort Inn? What she wonders is on that tape. And what we also wonder is whether there were additional suspects accompanying Atta and Alamari until the next morning departing from Jetport. As we should also wonder if there was more to be seen from Jetport's stop still CCTV security video other than the four frames. But before they reached that point, they were also witnessed by other travelers in the parking lot of Jetport. U.S. Airway ticket agent Michael Tuhey, who had checked in Atta and Alamari, has repeatedly said in interviews, So he says, I need to see your IDs. And uh, he sort of flips up a license, you know. And I, I just got a very bad vibe. I'm saying, if this guy don't look like an Arab terrorist, nobody does. And then I gave myself a political, a PC slap, you know. Of course, for Tuhe, being the only airport employee publicly accredited to witnessing and checking in Atta before boarding a flight that morning with Alamari, still played him with sleepless nights for years. The bag-handling employees from Logan later publicly confessed to handling the luggage left over that's said to belong to Ada, but no American Airlines ticket agent at Logan has ever come forth to having eye-to-eye -eye contact checking in Ata or Alamari. But in 2005, Michael Tuhey appeared on Oprah, revealing his distraught feelings of guilt and another layer of it when he learned that not long after, a ticket agent at Boston Logan who had checked in some of the hijackers had committed suicide as a result of failing to detect them, feeling guilty for checking them in, giving them the clearance to board their flights. 
but having gone past the U.S. Airways ticket counter at Jetport, Anta and Alamari board this U.S. Airways Colgon commuter flight 5930. 910 the final hours also interviewed two of the passengers, Brian Garrett and Roger Quiron, who also flew with Atta and Alamari to Logan. And for the first time, it actually showed a copy of Flight 5930's manifest, which has never been released publicly, which only eight passengers were flying on the 19-seater commuter plane. But if you take notice of the list of eight passengers, the first two listed are Brian Garrett and Roger Quiron. Atta and Alamari are listed as numbers six and eight. But through other research, Vincent Meisner, an engineer for Honeywell Corp, on his way to San Jose, is likely number four that's redacted, blurred out. Jane Eisenberg of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, is likely number seven that's in between Anta and Alomari. But seat numbers three and five are also redacted. Who were the other two passengers, and why hasn't the flight manifest been released in the first place? Could it have to do with other hijacking operatives that were accompanying them? Extra operatives crossing over through Canada into Maine could have took an earlier flight from Jetport, Maine, before Atta and Alamari took theirs the next morning after 5.45 a.m., and even if there wasn't anybody else with them on Flight 530. Those unaccounted for suspects who may have still been in their presence while in Portland could have simply taken another charter flight from Jetport at the same time, or as the possibility that at least two suspects could have simply joined them on commuter flight 5930, as pointed out with the flight manifest shown on 910 the final hours of flight 9530, at least two names are undetermined. But this fiasco throughout the state of Maine prior to 9-11 isn't the only Canadian connection attributed to Mohammed Atta. And strangely enough, the story doesn't end there with some of the passengers on flight 5930 from Jetport. According to news sources, mainly through the local Portland Press Herald, Roger Quiron and Brian Garrett, departing Jetport to Logan, connected to another flight for their final destination being Los Angeles, and boarded a Delta flight. But, they nearly ended up on American Airlines Flight 11 with Atta, Alamari, and the three other hijackers crashing into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. But American Airlines was too expensive, so they flew with Delta instead, according to Roger's wife, Tammy Quiron, interviewed in an Associated Press article September 14, 2001. They basically escaped death. They were extremely lucky. But not just because they avoided taking Flight 11, because the plane they embarked for LAX from Logan was Delta 1989. Security is so tight across the Midwest, passengers on this Delta jet in Cleveland were evacuated, while authorities made sure a threatened bomb was not on board. Delta 1989 was eventually grounded as all continental and commercial aviation flights were ordered to do so by the FAA who issued a no-fly ban one minute after Flight 175, the second plane struck the South Tower. Delta 1989 was grounded in Cleveland, Ohio at 9.47 a.m., but the story doesn't end there. Typically, as most viewers are familiar with scenes about Flight 93 in the internet blockbuster Loose Change 2nd Edition, Delta 1989 is also briefly mentioned, but not in the context of what's actually known about the Delta flight from Logan. Loose Change not only claims the suggested anomalous-looking crash site of Shanksville was a result of Flight 93 being shot down by early misleading mainstream news reports, Loose Change also still claims that no passenger remains were discovered and that the debris in Shanksville was actually from a different or empty duplicate airliner that was shot down by NORAD in that Flight 93 actually landed in Cleveland at 10.45 a.m. with all 200 passengers insinuating the passengers were from all four 9-11 planes combined on Flight 93, a hypothetical plane swap or switcheroo theory. And then after having landed and being parked in Cleveland, 30 minutes later at 11.15 a.m., the 200 passengers were released from Flight 93 and were brought into a NASA Glenn Research Center at the near west end of the airport, projecting an overall gross theory that the 9-11 hijackings were all hoaxes, where the passengers, instead of being victims, were actually crisis actors in an elaborate shadow government conspiracy, having acted out in making phone calls to loved ones, or in combination thereof, in that the 200 passengers may have also been authentic, but eliminated still after having made phone calls, executed inside a NASA facility. Although this film is not featured around Newark Airport and Flight 93, the intention is not to challenge or address why Lose Change and other filmmakers propagate these hoaxes regarding the hijackings of September 11th. But regarding Delta 1989, Lose Change falsely states that the Delta flight landed at 10.10 a.m., but does accurately tell that Cleveland Hopkins Airport was evacuated and that before Delta 1989 landed, there was already a rumor amiss that a hijacked plane was going to land with a bomb, but Loose Change makes a false assertion that this was mixed up with Flight 93. 
because there's more about Delta 1989 that's left out, which is ironic because the next segment we're going to show is from a History Channel special grounded on 9-11 from 2005 about the stories of air traffic controllers in the U.S. and Canada who were able to successfully ground all commercial air traffic, thousands of planes, right within hours after the 9-11 attacks. By 9.20, with close to 4,500 flights still over or approaching North America, two planes over Cleveland Center are not responding to controller calls. Delta 1989 and United 93 will be listed as the fourth and fifth hijackings of the day unless controllers can re-establish communication. Cleveland Center had several aircraft with which they did not have contact, whether they were in the middle of a frequency change, whether they were aircraft that weren't responding to calls, but at one point or another, there were several aircraft airborne that nobody was certain about. When a pilot crosses from one controller's sector into another, he must switch to the next controller's frequency. During the process, it's not uncommon for dropouts to occur, briefly rendering the plane's radio silent. But on 9-11, dropouts on the two planes above Cleveland Center have far more sinister implications. At about 35,000 feet, United 93 and Delta 1989 cross paths. As United 93's radar signal momentarily blinks off, controllers hear someone scream on an errant frequency. But because the caller did not repeat or include a flight ID number, controllers cannot confirm from which plane the call is made. Somebody call Cleveland. United 1523, did you hear uh, some interference on the frequency a uh, couple minutes ago, screaming? Yes, I did, 797, and uh, I, we couldn't tell what it was either. There was confusion in watching the screen. Those planes crossed, and they lost sight of exactly which plane was which. So they had a tremendous number of challenges. As the FAA and law enforcement started trying to profile, for lack of a better word, the types of aircraft that were involved, heavy jet departures from the East Coast, West Coast destinations, Cleveland Center had stewardship of several of those types of airplanes, including a Delta flight that they immediately suspected might be another uh, potential hijacked target. Besides the planes that hit the towers, Delta 1989 is the only other 767 direct from Boston to LA, departing at 8 a.m. Following the unconfirmed distress call to Cleveland Center, the Delta pilot reports an unruly passenger to his company dispatchers. Suspicions of a hijacking are raised further when he requests an unscheduled landing at Cleveland Airport. The FBI and Cleveland SWAT bring in their heaviest equipment to confront any hijackers. With the events going on throughout the country, uh, obviously we knew we were under attack. Uh, what goes through your mind. Uh, at that time, things were happening so quickly, we just had to be focused on the mission we were given to come out to the uh, Cleveland Hopkins International Airport to handle a hijacked uh, aircraft. But it doesn't end there. In comparison to the minimal detail from History Channel's Grounded on 9-11 about unruly passengers on Delta Flight 1989, because according to the Boston Herald, September 19, 2001, underneath the headline, War on Terrorism, two more planes possibly targeted on the Day of Terror by Doug Hanchin and Cosmo Mosera Jr. states that Sources say at least one female passenger reported suspicious behavior by two male passengers. Sources say the woman told federal investigators the two men appeared nervous as the flight sat on Logan's runway awaiting takeoff. She also said they repeatedly looked around the cabin as they were restless early in the flight, as if they had been looking for others but couldn't find them. But from a much more obscure article from the Massachusetts Warham Courier on September 20th, 2001, written by Ruth Thompson, who interviewed a female passenger, Mary McFadden, documenting her story with her family, who were originally planning to be on the doomed American Airlines Flight 11 that struck the North Tower. But at last minute, she changed her family's flight to Delta 1989 for a lower fee. McFadden said in hindsight, there were irregularities during her flight that may or may not have had a connection to the terrorism taking place on other planes. There was one man on our plane who would not get off his cell phone, she said. He was speaking in a low, urgent voice. Even when the stewardess went over to him to tell him to turn off the phone, he wouldn't. That's very odd. She also spoke of another passenger who said a man in the seat next to her spooked her because he kept turning his head and looking around throughout the entire flight. It was as though he was waiting for someone, McFadden said. Maybe they were going to hit our plane, 
but the others didn't show up. I don't know. You think of things. While in flight, McFadden said they were not aware of anything unusual taking place in the world outside their cabin. But then when we had to make an emergency landing, we were told there may be a bomb on the plane or it may be getting hijacked. As you can see, someone else was also just as lucky as passengers Roger Quiron and Brian Garrett, as it seems there very well may have been three flights targeted for hijacking out of Boston Logan Airport. That perhaps the intentions of those suspicious Middle Eastern passengers on board Delta 1989 were to hijack the plane accompanied by other potential terrorist hijacking conspirators. But for whatever reason, whether it could have been additional suspects chickening out last minute, or weren't able to board Delta 1989 for some unknown or technical reason. But as far as Logan Airport goes, Delta 1989 isn't the only additional suspected flight. According to BBC News on September 18th, an article titled, FBI Probes Attempted Fifth Hijack, the article states that another suspected American Airlines plane out of Boston Logan, Flight 43, was an additional target that the FBI were searching for a number of passengers who were due to fly on American Airlines Flight 43 from Boston, which was grounded due to a mechanical problem. It was scheduled at 8.10 a.m. departure from Boston. So now we're looking at the potential that there were four intended hijackings from Boston Logan. However, in the Daily Telegraph on September 20th, in an article titled, More Planes May Have Been Targeted, FBI up to five other flights on September 11th, regarded by FBI as suspicious, that yet, Another United Airlines flight out of Logan, destined for San Francisco, was suspected by the FBI as a potential target for hijacking. But according to one of the passengers, Janice Burnett, that it may have been spared due to the fact that there were 30 U.S. Marines traveling on it, and that those guys were pretty visible in the boarding area, big and muscular, with the trademark haircuts and duffel bags. And also in the same Boston Herald article mentioned earlier regarding Delta 1989 from September 19th, Meanwhile, a group of Boston area tourists headed to San Francisco on United Airlines Flight 163 earlier that fateful morning said they were informed by airport security personnel in Iowa that their plane may have also been eyed by terrorists. They just told us we were targeted, said passenger Ruth Vanna of Malden. That's how they worded it. According to Janice Burnett, a tour guide with the Milford-based Scout Tours who was on the flight, security workers at the Desmond Airport where the plane was forced to land told passengers that the FBI discovered information on their flight in a car believed to belong to the terrorists. The car, a rental that was left at Logan, was towed away and impounded by the FBI last week. With these revelations in mind, we are looking at the basic scope that ultimately there could have been five intended hijack targets for flights at Boston Logan included with the two successful hijackings that struck the Twin Towers. And with three additional suspect aircraft from Logan, two of them being flights having departed with possibly other hijacking operatives having either backed out, and one of them possibly running into complications carrying out their missions, you might start to understand now what likely all the fiasco from Canada and Maine was all about added with those later detained and anomalous reporting on the Boston area hotels afterward, and also reported by Associated Press in the Boston Herald about the Boston dragnet at Park Inn Hotel where the Alsheri brothers stayed at, it says, The Immigration and Naturalization Service also detained an Everett man of Middle Eastern descent who was in the U.S. illegally and has traveled frequently between Everett and a location in Canada, the Herald reported. INS spokesman Karen Krashar would not comment on the report. Everett is just outside of Boston, but it becomes clear that these types of additional and unidentified suspects may have been or were supposed to participate in carrying out other hijackings or different terrorist actions or even just as a support role. That's why when it comes to Boston Logan CCTV security video being released, it's long overdue to fill the void of public inquiries and skepticism to confirm all 10 official hijackers, 5 to each plane boarding flights 11 and 175 as regular passengers. And although there are countless anomalies and investigative details alluding to cover-up regarding Mohammed Atta and Abdelaziz Alamari, as well as the alleged eight hijackers of Flight 11 and 175 at Logan, which we don't have enough time to focus on all their profiles for this documentary, which is a subject big enough to independently address in a different film, challenging the official scope of conspirators, as the direction of this film is intended to focus on the most relevant hijackers, suspects, and activities within, and just outside the perimeter of Logan and the Boston area, outside the official scope of 19 hijackers and 4 airliners. But unlike Jetport, Maine, where security CCTV stop-still video confirmed that Atta and Alamari boarded their connecting flight to Boston Logan, 
You can see now as to why authorities haven't released any of the security CCTV video from Logan Airport that was seized by the FBI in the immediate dragnet investigation. Because of the truth be told, then we're actually dealing with a situation where potentially five airliners are targeted for hijacking out of Logan. As you can imagine, there certainly would have been many Middle Eastern suspects throughout the airport and departure lounges, possibly congregating with different hijacking teams, or even some of the hijackers themselves on flights 11 and 175 were not identifiable. Or it could be a different amount of hijackers per plane. But if stories about Atta or other alleged hijackers being present at airports before September 11th is unfamiliar, then take a look what was soon reported after 9-11, continued in follow-up reports even a decade later about Logan, as with Boston's ABC5 WCVB-TV picked up, that at least three airport employee eyewitnesses spotted Atta and others casing the security checkpoints at Logan months before the September 11th attacks. Four months before Mohammed Atta and Al-Qaeda agents began their operation, the morning of September 11th, multiple witnesses say they saw them casing security checkpoints at Logan Airport. They say they reported it and that nothing was done. Mohammed Atta was spotted on May 11th at uh, Logan. Brian Sullivan is a retired FAA special agent who had warned authorities of weaknesses at Logan. He says he was largely ignored. And now we know from these documents that he wasn't the only one issuing warnings. Wallace sees it. He um, is concerned. He, he confronts them. In May of 2001, an American Airlines technician says he witnessed Mohammed Atta and another man videotaping and taking still photos of the checkpoint for 45 minutes. When he confronted him, he says they swore at him in Arabic and walked away. He followed them and alerted a state trooper, recounting later, I said specifically, these two clowns are up to something. They've been taking videos and pictures down at the checkpoint. Nothing was done. They didn't stop out of, they didn't ask for an ID, they didn't question him, uh, none of that. So he's basically allowed to go through. Two other American Airlines employees say they witnessed Atta and another man casing the security checkpoint that they would later walk right through on their way to board Flight 11. There's also quite a few other declassified documents pertaining to previous investigations before September 11th, not necessarily centered in recognizing Atta, or even Logan solely, as there were particularly security lapses with different airlines and even Argenbright security, which also provided service there. We're all penalized for breaking regulations, like suspicious weapons such as guns, that were able to pass through security screening, and cases of possible dry runs at other airports, and sub-odd occurrences happening at Logan previously. Although it is true in recent times that Atta's mother in Cairo says that she believes her son Mohammed was really captured and is really alive in Guantanamo Bay, his father, who was separated from his mother at the time of the attacks, Mohammed El Amir Awad Al Sayyad Atta, who was an attorney in Egypt, now deceased, but at the time of his first interview saying he received a call from his son 24 to 48 hours after the attacks, and also said that he believed Israel was behind the attacks. <laughs> يحدث هذا الموضوع إلا الموساد وله سوابق الموساد له سوابق وسوابق تكاد تكون نسخة من هذا الحدث. He continued to profess that the Mossad was involved even up until 2004, stating that he believed they killed his son because he had not heard from him in a long time. Atta's father refused to be interviewed for this program unless the New York Times paid $25,000 to a Palestinian charity. But in this earlier interview, he insists his son was an innocent victim of a wicked conspiracy by American and Israeli intelligence. He was religious, sensitive and pure. He wasn't an extremist. Mossad did it. They hit America to weaken the Arabs in order to swallow Palestine. There are a lot of other inconsistencies about Atta's profile reported in the beginning, such as alleging he was involved in a bus attack in Jerusalem in 1986, which he would have been too young for. Atta was said to be in the U.S. on a tourist visa, something that should not have happened because he was reportedly linked to an attack in Israel. And there are some other inconsistencies about his profile as an alleged Islamic fundamentalist that could possibly lend to having been a Mossad asset, particularly when he was witnessed partaking in alcohol and cocaine while living in Florida, dating a pink-haired stripper. According to author Daniel Hopsicker in his book Mohammed Atta and the Venice Flying Circus, who interviewed Atta's former girlfriend in Florida, Amanda Keller, 
who said that Atta also told her he could speak Hebrew and spoke some of it in front of her, even though she wasn't familiar with the language. According to the French magazine Intelligence Online and the infamous DEA documents pertaining to Israeli art students involved in an ecstasy ring, selling art door-to-door, -door, conducting espionage before the 9-11 attacks, Mossad agents lived next door to an address of Atta in Florida. There's a lot more mystery behind the Egyptian Atta that we can make an entire film on. As beside for Marwan al Shehi, who's originally from the United Arab Emirates, we haven't actually focused so much on the rest of the other seven Saudi nationals and one other United Arab Emirates hijacker from Logan. But as Atta being deemed as ringleader by the media and subsequent worldwide dragnet, al Shehi as a team leader also in Logan becomes more relevant since they are the only active Hamburg cell members in the 9-11 plot, besides Flight 93 hijacker, the Lebanese Ziad Jarar, who appears in the only video with Ada. It was later reported in 2009 by the New York Times that Ziad Jarar had at least two cousins who were busted as Mossad spies in Lebanon, going as far back as 25 years with one of his older cousins, Ali. And there's also reason to believe that Jar may have not even boarded Flight 93. So although there's more focus on Saudi Arabia and even some on Pakistan state sponsorship, it wouldn't be too far off or too far-fetched to be suspicious of any Israeli sponsorship or Mossad aid and handling in the vicinity of the attacks, being that it is often claimed that Logan Airport was contracted through Huntley Security, which is a subsidiary of ICTS, which is practically Israeli-owned and operated. Although it may have sounded as a good idea that perhaps through ICTS, the Mossad gave operational support with the hijackers, bypassing passenger security with weapons, but such a claim is unnecessary with what's really being uncovered here. As I've already pointed out in other films, is that the internal airport perimeter amongst its employees was the real security problem, and not just for the passenger security screening companies, which also... Argenbright Security Service, Logan, as well. It's been a problem here for years, I, I have to tell you. They also have had their security successes here. But there have been notorious cases, for example, two summers ago, a teenager managed to get over the fence surrounding Logan Airport. He was dressed as an ascetic Jew. He got over a fence with razor wire on top of it. He went to a 747, got into it, and made his way all the way to London, a notorious case here two summers ago. So yes, uh, Logan has had problems over the years. Another great example why an ICTS theory is unnecessary is because of the case in late July of 1999. As Bill Delaney just mentioned and CBS News properly put in a title from an AP article, 17-year-old's Mossad edition, where the young Abraham Derman snuck on board a British Airways flight to London and then Israel, originally departing from Boston Logan. Derman was the stowaway disguised in a Hasidic outfit and was able to do so by penetrating through Logan's security at the airport near the parked airliners and said he had done this stunt for some sort of initiation to impress two Mossad agents. To get another idea of how extremely vulnerable Logan Airport as well as many U.S. airports then, there's another story not too familiar with both the public and 9-11 truthers is that this Boston Logan employee, Hussein Al Husseini, who at one time worked with two other fellow Iraqis who were also brothers and his roommates and provided food catering services for commercial airlines there, were also investigated after 9-11. According to investigative journalism work by Doug Hagman of Canada Free Press in 2005, he was able to obtain Hussein Al Hussein's confidential psychiatric records from 1997 while he was suffering anxiety regarding his airport job so acute that he checked into a psychiatric hospital to seek treatment for reoccurring panic attacks. When asked about the source of his trepidation, he told his therapist, If something happens there, I will be suspect. Some of you might be surprised with this case because of how many years prior it is to 9-11. Others of you wouldn't be if you've researched false flags, because attention wasn't first drawn to Hussein al Husseini because of his roommates or having been employed at Boston Logan previously. It's because he is one of the infamous prime suspects known as John Doe No. 2, who's the main subject or suspect in a book documented by former Oklahoma City newscaster Jaina Davis in The Third Terrorist that explicitly covers Al Husseini being involved in the Oklahoma City bombing in which he was seen in the rider truck accompanied with Timothy McVeigh moments before the bombing. After leaving Oklahoma City in 1995, Al Husseini made his way back to the Boston area, which is where he lived originally after first entering the country. And not to mention, besides for the only additional 9-11 conspirator charged in the attacks as the alleged 20th hijacker, Zacharias Massawi, who had also lived outside of Oklahoma City, attending a flight school, 
where also Atta and Al Shehi were once witnessed staying there briefly in July of 2000 after having visited flight schools. But coming back to Boston, one other familiar suspect from the area, Nabil Al Marab, who was a Boston cab driver, as well as in numerous other cities as he was frequently known to move around. Al Marab was arrested in Chicago on September 18th under extreme suspicion and evidence that he was associated with some of the hijackers. Most likely was supposed to be involved in the attacks until all flights were grounded after the FAA's no-fly ban. While living in Boston, these were the people that were Al Marab's roommates and associates. The question, was there some kind of a terrorist cell here in Boston that enabled these hijackers to lay the groundwork for what they did? Now, a security expert I spoke to here this morning, Kira, said in many ways Boston is an ideal place for that sort of thing. It is a small city, but a major city, and importantly, it's near an international border, Canada. Now, we know before the millennium, an Algerian was arrested on the Vermont, Vermont border, this Algerian found to have ties to another Algerian who tried at that time to cross into Washington state for a terrorist action uh, at the time of the millennium in Seattle. So we've seen that sort of thing here before. Also, we don't know if Arabs were involved in this, but if they were, there is a sizable Arab community here in Boston. It's a place one could obtain some anonymity, this security source said to me. Uh, I should also mention that earlier this year, the FBI did determine that in the late 90s, there were uh, Arab men here, too, with ties to the Osama bin Laden organization. They left suddenly in the late 90s, but one of them, a man named Bassam Kanj, had lived here for some 15 years working as a cab driver. He was subsequently killed in Lebanon in an attack on the Leban Lebanese army, uh, uh, financed, uh, security sources believe, by Osama bin Laden. The other Arab, Rail Hijazi, also was a cab driver here in Boston. He is in jail in Jordan uh, for uh, a, an involvement in a plan to blow up a hotel in Jordan that contained mostly American and Israeli tourists at the time of the millennium. So uh, there have been traces of people tied to Osama bin Laden, if indeed Osama bin Laden was involved in this in the past here in Boston. And as I say, Hundreds of federal, state, and local investigators now trying to sort out how hijackers got on those two planes here at Logan Airport yesterday. Just as with many holes in the official 9-11 story taking shape at this moment, it has never been proven that Osama bin Laden was behind the Millennium Plot, especially for attacks being carried out in Jordan and Lebanon. But as far as this connection of Millennium Plot conspirators to Boston, the Boston Cab Company was also investigated after 9-11 due to the fact that Al Marab and those cohorts worked with him there, being involved in those terrorist acts in 1999-2000. Plus, working as a Boston cab driver gave them frequent access and familiarity of Logan Airport. Al Marab also lived off and on in Toronto, Canada, working for his uncle in his print shop, where many people in the neighborhood recognized seeing hijackers Atta and Al Shehi inside as if they were almost working there. Again, we seem to have another Canadian connection to Atta, but one that's concrete. Almarab's story, and like many other suspects arrested after 9-11, and also additional targeted flights from September 11th and 13th, when airports started reopening, are all featured on my full-length and extensive film released in December of 2020, 9-11 Bojinka Maximum, Untold Hijacking Attempts of September 11th and 13th. Another important circumstance that's worth noting, as also discussed in that film, is that most airports started to reopen again after the Department of Transportation lifted the no-fly ban two days after 9-11 on Thursday 9-13, September 13th. And besides Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C., which remained closed the longest for two weeks due to the proximity of all the neighboring high-risk targets, Boston Logan reopened on Saturday, September 15, taking the second longest to open out of all airports. But like New York area airports on 913, Logan was met with complications trying to reopen. Um, one quick note, I want to, and I want to go to the Pentagon. I came across this a moment ago, just a sense of how jittery things are in the country. A man was taken off a Delta Airlines flight, uh, Boston, that would be Boston Logan, and you see the significance there, to Atlanta for what's described as sus uh, suspicious and rowdy behavior. The man was, quote, vaguely Arab looking. In quote, I don't have a clue what that means, to be honest, and kept changing seats in first class. Uh, it's very jittery there. 
And at Boston's Logan Airport tonight, a Delta flight bound for Atlanta returned to the gate and a passenger was taken into custody. Flight 1069 was ready to take off when the captain made an announcement saying there was a safety emergency. After returning to the gate, police stormed that plane and removed a man. Witnesses say he appeared to be of Middle Eastern descent. There is no information about why he was taken into custody. According to 9-11 documents released on the government archive site, 5AWA-210 timeline W9005 crisis hijacked aircraft that's mostly redacted seems to show charted news or emergency reports on 9-11 and the following days up until Sunday, September 16th. And on Saturday, 9-15, it says at 10-18 a.m., Regarding this incident with Delta Flight 1069 at Logan, Boston, questionable passenger on Delta 1069, paid ticket with cash, moved to several different seats, suspect removed from aircraft, luggage removed also, suspects cleared by Mass SP, which likely stands for Massachusetts State Police. And it also says at 11.40 a.m., Boston, TWA 192 on ground with questionable suspect on board, aircraft met with Mass SP and FBI. But scrolling down after, on page 21, looking into sections with the official 9-11 flights, it states a Delta flight with no number or date, only that it was departing Boston to LAX. 1239 reports that a Middle Eastern woman and baby would be aboard the flight with a bomb on their person, and indicates that a nonspecific bomb threat was called in at around 9.47 p.m. local time. Considering that this happens days after September 11th, it also might be worth considering that some flights may have been targeted by a bombing rather than a hijacking, similar to the Bojinka plan discovered on the 1993 World Trade Center bomber. Ramsey Youssef's laptop in the Philippines while fugitive in 1995, which was a plot to bomb a dozen airliners filled with passengers, which may have also been part of a second wave or follow-up attacks after 9-11, once the airports would reopen, considering that this happened. But more importantly, this realization so far and what we've presented in this film, inferring a wider scale of attacks just coming out of Boston Logan on September 11th alone, should also raise questions as to what the intended targets were for the other three airliners had they succeeded in becoming hijacked, separate from flights 11 and 175. Because other than the city of Boston being a potential target during or after 9-11, which was also thought after the initial crisis, with likely insiders privy to at least three additional or possibly targeted flights, as aforementioned on September 11th, like Delta 1989, were all continental routes to arrive in California, as were the two official 9-11 flights that struck the Twin Towers. And even without viewing or the hint of 9-11 Bojinka Maximum untold hijacking attempts of September 11th and 13th, just from what we've independently covered on Logan, the question should then be considered as to what were the other worthy landmarks in New York for additional planes to strike, like the Empire State and UN buildings, or maybe to strike the Twin Towers again, while they were still standing. Can you imagine how worse 9-11 could have been? That's how large a cover-up we're dealing with when you combine what explosive and graphic detail and information authorities and the news media buried with the destruction of the Twin Towers immediately after the attacks and on the following day, as they did burying all these stories about additional Middle Eastern suspects and extra-targeted commercial airliners for hijackings. And when you actually look at the whole big picture and state of emergency in what was eventually covered up about the attacks, it has more to do about reducing the full conspiracy, reducing the perception of the devastation and what the conspirators were capable of, and reducing the perception management of the real looming threat that was still at our midst, but not necessarily fabricating evidence, while the George W. Bush administration did not care for no accuracy as far as the investigation and making sure every stone is unturned. Most likely, with all the devastation and the conspirators at hand with just the hijacked flights, Bush and his neocon cronies knew they had a pretext big enough in an attempt to shift the blame on Iraq, which failed, just like the subsequent useless targeting of the Taliban in Afghanistan, with lesser resource interests. And we know the Bush administration and other higher-ups in government didn't actually care about the FBI nor 9-11 Commission investigation results later on when separate from the hundreds of Middle Eastern and Muslim suspects arrested in the dragnet after September 11th, and then downgraded to immigration and naturalization charges, over a hundred Israelis were also arrested for spying as a result, and only detained for a couple of months through some level of diplomatic immunity, eventually being deported back to Israel. These arrests reached as high as 200 Israelis, according to reports later on in March 2002. But the most popular case of Israelis arrested after 9-11, is the infamous Dancing Israelis, also known as the High Fivers in Weehawken, New Jersey, working for Urban Moving Systems, the reported Mossad front company. 
As the high-fiving Israelis were witnessed filming both planes strike the Twin Towers from Doric Towers parking lot across the Hudson River, next to their white UMS van and celebrated, which led them to being reported to local police with their vehicle and license plate number put on an APB All Points Bulletin, BOLO, be on the lookout, and later pulled over in their white van which tested positive for explosives, a subject I have extensively covered in films before, particularly explosives on the George Washington Bridge, 9-11 truth or urban myth. According to the partially declassified FBI full field investigation released around the 10-year anniversary through a Freedom of Information Act request in 2011 about urban moving systems and other Israeli-owned moving companies in Jersey, which also indicates that there were other urban moving systems vans from the New Jersey location operating out of state during the attacks. And on section 1, page 36, it states that a UMS van was seen outside of Boston much earlier in the day on 9-11. It says... Newark also received information which revealed that on about 1 p.m., 9-11-2001, three dark-skinned males had been observed driving a white van bearing New Jersey plates on Spirit Brook Road near Nashua, New Hampshire, just outside of Boston. According to the report, the driver of the van appeared to be lost. The van had a sign on the side for Urban Moving Systems. Although this is quite a revelation, particularly for some serious 9-11 truth seekers, this APB bolo for the urban moving systems van outside of Boston was picked up by Pennsylvania newspaper Lancaster New Era on September 12th. But because of the limited time window when the Boston area UMS van was spotted, it's almost hard to determine whether it was the first suspicious UMS van called into the authorities after the attacks or the one generally known from New Jersey at the Doric Towers with the high fivers witnessed by apartment resident Maria, who initially reported to the police what she witnessed after her husband came back from jury duty. The police report from Massachusetts Vans says dark-skinned males. As pointed out in my previous film, on the afternoon of September 11th at 4.20 p.m., before the first all-points bulletin for the Be On The Lookout of the high-fiving Israeli's white UMS van in Jersey from Joe Shortsleeve, written on the back is Urban Moving Systems. He had also reported this nine minutes earlier. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. I'm uh, being brought some uh, late information here that I'll share with you at this moment. Uh, it comes out of uh, Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford. We're being told there that the Office of Special Investigations at Hanscom Air Force Base, at the uh, just out in Bedford, has confirmed that an all-points bulletin, an APB, has been put out for two cars, each containing at least one Middle Eastern male, one uh, Middle Eastern appearing male. Uh, this uh, information has been confirmed by the Air Force as well as the uh, Bedford Post. Bedford Police. Again, uh, the Office of Special Investigation has an all-points bulletin out uh, for two cars, each containing uh, a man of Middle Eastern descent. Two different vehicles with quote-unquote Middle Eastern men? The Hanscom area? The Hanscom area is in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, in the direction of New Hampshire. And Jack, we have learned now that authorities are looking for uh, a number of vehicles, two cars with at least two men of Eastern, Middle Eastern descent in the Hanscom area. And nationally, they're looking for a white Chevy van with New Jersey plates. And on the back bumper, it says something to the effect of urban moving system. So uh, all points bulletin out for these vehicles and these individuals. So how they may be connected, none of us actually knows at this point. What authorities were doing looking for these two vehicles there at this time of the day on 9-11 is unknown. But being paired here with WBZ4 Channel 4 News on an afternoon report for an APB bolo outside Boston with the Israeli High Fivers UMS van in New Jersey, seems possible that maybe one of these two additional vehicles with Middle Eastern men may very well have been this UMS van with three dark-skinned males detailed in the FBI police reports. But what was this white UMS van doing outside of Boston on 9-11? Was the van eventually apprehended and suspects detained? As you might recall, earlier CNN reports with Bill Delaney on September 14th. As investigators here in the New England region following thousands, really tens of thousands of leads as they try to understand how 10 hijackers hijacked those two 767s last Tuesday. Now, one intriguing fragment. I'm standing at Eastern Air Charter in Norwood, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, where law enforcement officials and other sources tell us several days before the hijacking, uh, men identified as Middle Eastern types were here at Eastern Air Charter making inquiries. They wanted to know about chartering a twin-engine jet. 
They wanted to know about that jet's fuel capacity. They wanted to know how soon they could charter such a jet. Could they do it quickly? And they wanted to know how long it would take to fly to New York. Now, one high law enforcement official I spoke to said to me, Joey, he believed that there was a high possibility, he said, that these were either the hijackers themselves or another team. Now, of course, the FBI hasn't ruled out the possibility that other teams are still at large. Eastern Air Charter officials themselves downplaying all this. But another source told us law enforcement authorities have been here, he said, tearing the place apart. Now, this may sound like another clue or suggestion in that the additional unidentified Middle Eastern types, as Delaney said, may have been targeting another airport just outside of Boston, Eastern Air Charter, or the Norwood Memorial Airport that has nothing to do with our additional urban moving systems van outside of Boston or suspected vehicle within that vicinity in the Hanscom Bedford area. But again, according to the Boston Herald on September 15th, suspicious visits to two airfields are probed by Tom Farber and Maggie Mulvihill. Three Middle Eastern men went to Hanscom Field in Bedford and twice visited Norwood Airport in July and August looking for aviation equipment and information about leasing a jet, heightening investigators' suspicions of a sinister connection to Tuesday's devastating attack on America, sources confirmed. While federal authorities executed the first of a series of expected search warrants in the Boston area yesterday, FBI agents and local investigators returned to Norwood Airport to determine if the reported activities of three men who claim to be Middle Eastern royalty are connected to the terror bombings. They claim to be pilots from a Middle Eastern royal family and while they were here, they said they wanted to buy some radio transceivers, one source said. We still don't know who these people are, but it sure looks like it could be connected to the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington. According to sources, the three men showed up at the pilot shop at Norwood Airport on July 28 and inquired about purchasing airline transceivers radios that can both monitor and transmit airline frequencies. The men were told by employees of the Norwood shop they didn't have what they were looking for and suggested they try Hanscom Field in Bedford, sources said. The men took a taxi to Bedford where they inquired about the equipment, but were told what they wanted was sold at Norwood Airport. The men returned to Norwood by cab and apparently resolving the confusion, bought an unspecified number of transceivers and possibly other aviation equipment, sources said. Money was apparently no object, said a source. They took cabs back and forth without any concern to the cost. About 10 to 15 days before Tuesday's attack, the men returned to Norwood Airport and asked an employee of Eastern Air Charter Incorporated a series of detailed questions about leasing a twin-engine jet and about the plane's fuel consumption and related issues. They wanted to know what the fuel consumption would be from point A to point B and so forth, said a source. It was very detailed and very specific. Authorities first went to Norwood Airport immediately following Tuesday's attacks after the presence of the three men there was reported, sources said, adding one of the destinations discussed for the leased jet was New York. Sources said the men also wanted to know if they could pay cash, how quickly they could lease the jet, and if they could get it on short notice. Well, well, well. It seems we have some glaringly strong coincidences going on here and that the suspects Bill Delaney reported on is at least part of the APB Bolo from WBZ4 on the afternoon of 9-11 with the two vehicles in the Hanscom Bedford area, which incidentally, according to this Boston Herald article, also seems to fit the description of the FBI police reports on the urban moving systems van outside of Boston up near the Nashua, New Hampshire area, which is just near Bedford. However, there's a possibility we might know what the model of the second vehicle in the Hanscom Bedford area, according to the Lowell Sun in Massachusetts, September 12th, reservists Guardsman Stan Reddy, Devons, Hanscom, moved to heighten alert. Closer to home, the Devons Reserve Force Training Area and Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford went to heightened security alert as a result of yesterday's attacks, as well as Westover Air Reserve Base in Chicopee and Otis Air National Guard Base in Bourne. Last night, all roads into Devons, a former U.S. Army base, were blocked to traffic. The most alarming rumors centered around Hanscom, where Massachusetts State Police were looking for a blue-green Toyota with two Middle Eastern-looking men who were asking directions from the Bedford base to Peace International Tradesport in Newington, New Hampshire. And if that didn't sound strikingly similar, being in the same vicinity and direction towards New Hampshire, in the Nashua Telegraph September 12th, FAA workers on alert, children evacuated from daycare. It says that about 80 to 100 kids were evacuated from the Launching Pad Child Learning Center on Tuesday morning, September 11th, because of its proximity to the Federal Aviation Center 
on Northeastern Boulevard, which is operated by and adjacent to the Boston Air Traffic Control Center. The article says, the FAA was feared to be a potential target during the spate of airplane bombings around the northern eastern United States during the morning hours, and the FAA told the daycare center for six-week-olds to six-year-olds to lock down Tuesday morning, and shortly thereafter issued an order to evacuate. Sometime during the chaos, a bomb threat was also made against the school. In the same document aforementioned earlier, it also details this scenario going on at 10.55 and 11.05 a.m. It's hard to figure out whether any of this has to do with the two vehicles, and if they were the additional Urban Moving Systems van or Blue Green Toyota mentioned in the Lowell Sun, but it is strikingly similar given the bomb threat, as with the high-fiving Israelis and their UMS white van in New Jersey, additionally detailed in the APB Bolo, according to the arresting Bergen County Police Officer Scott DiCarlo, that the van may have possibly been carrying explosives to target the George Washington Bridge. But it's difficult to puzzle when there hasn't been any independent investigative exploration in this area, or even when more pages are still redacted in the field reports within the FBI documents pertaining to New Jersey than those that have been unredacted. But when considering all the damning evidence of at least foreknowledge, coordination would have been key in the attacks, especially if the high-fiving Israelis had such advanced knowledge on the events than what the truth movement conventionally believe, being set right in the parking lot of the Doric Towers, able to film the first plane, Flight 11 strike into the North Tower from across the Hudson River. Would the UMS presence outside of Boston near Nashua, New Hampshire, likely have to do with the fact that Flights 11 and 175 departed from Logan, in which the attack initiation point starts from? The fact that there are reports on additional suspects who were seen even arguing in the Logan parking lot Added with the other aborted hijacking attempts and also the following day on 9-12, with additional suspects arrested at Boston hotels, with more additionally included in the Boston Herald article aforementioned on the Hanscom and Norwood fiasco, could the function of this and other white UMS vans outside of Boston have been to provide transportation for any additional, unaccounted for, 9-11 operatives? Could it have something to do with the three Middle Eastern men previously seen at Norwood, particularly for the type of equipment they purchased? Airplane radio transceivers? Could that also have to do with the bomb threats coming out of the Federal Aviation Center and Boston Air Traffic Control in New Hampshire, who had originally tracked and attempted to communicate with Flights 11 and 175 after departing off course from Logan? It may very well be, and it also could be that urban moving systems had employed Al-Qaeda operatives or Arab terrorists just as a means of support or helping to aid in the attack. And considering how big the September 11th attacks could have been, it also could be that some of the actual succeeding hijackers did not know they were participating in a suicide mission, at least not until last minute. According to The Guardian, October 14, 2001, under the headline, attackers did not know they were to die. Unlike the eight lead attackers, who were all trained pilots, they did not leave messages for friends and family indicating they knew their lives were over. None of them had copies of the instructions for prayer and contemplation on the eve of the attacks and for opening your chest to God. At the moment of immolation, which FBI agents discovered in the luggage of Mohammed Atta, the man believed to be the hijacker's leader, who flew the first plane to destruction in New York. It is understood the FBI has found evidence suggesting the 11 men expected to take part in conventional hijackings, with the planes flown to distant airports and the passengers and crew taken hostage while the hijackers presented demands. Items found among the 11 men's possessions suggest they had been preparing themselves for incarceration. One source said, it looks as they expected they might be going to prison, not paradise. But until then, we'll have to wait until more 9-11 documents are declassified. And there should be an equal amount of investment and focus just as there is with the World Trade Center and Ground Zero by the 9-11 Truth Movement. But regarding the hijacker cells and their associates, who were eventually captured, then freed. And separate from the immediate dragnet detainees, it's also important to pay attention or to seek transparency regarding the Guantanamo detainees because even an official story is being preserved which needs to be publicly challenged about the official 9-11 conspirators' alleged associates overseas. A false narrative that is preserved willfully, as with some cases of Gitmo detainee testimonies are based off torture. And chronologically speaking, also, consider the timing of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's first public interview, along with Ramzi bin al-Sheib for Yossi Fouda of Al Jazeera, being in April 2002, this is when KSM decided to take credit for the attacks, having already been filtered to an official scale of four hijacked planes and 19 hijackers. This KSM interview and confession was conducted two months after the investigation began, February 2002, 
by the joint inquiry into intelligence community activities before and after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, otherwise known as the JIS, who released their final report later that year in December when the initial resolutions in the Senate called for the establishment of an independent bipartisan committee the following December 2001, just four months after 9-11. This being a point in time when a growing suspicion between government and media officials and conscious citizens witnessing or experiencing the escalation of the cover-up with the FBI and law enforcement, with the amount of subsequent arrests of hundreds of Middle Easterners and Muslims suspected as terrorists in the immediate dragnet after September 11th, which besides for Zacharias Massawi already in custody weeks before September 11th, eventually, all of the 9-11 dragnet detainees were suddenly downgraded to immigration and naturalization, INS charges, eventually collected in what is now known as the OIG list of aliens held on immigration charges in connection with the investigation of September 11 attacks from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Inspector General. But going back to KSM, the alleged 9-11 mastermind, he never stated he was the head of the Al-Qaeda military committee. And yet, with all the controversial circumstances to how many times he had been waterboarded and inconsistencies to crimes he's allegedly confessed to, along with what has been made public from it, KSM's initial capture, then transferred to Gitmo sequentially after the releases of the JIS and 9-11 Commission reports, and subsequent with his alleged confessions, whether real or fabricated, are basically there to reaffirm the official scale of the 9-11 Commission report, in that KSM, Osama bin Laden, and the Al-Qaeda network were only capable of managing four hijacked planes and that there were no use of explosives, neither within the hijacking takeover of the four official flights, even though passenger calls made from two of the flights stated the contrary, that the hijackers did have bombs. And we already know that Bush administration officials were either lying or were completely misinformed in the notion of previous administration and government not aware that such an attack like 9-11, using multiple airliners to crash into building targets, was not thought of or known. Considering the discovery of the Bojinka plot by KSM's fugitive nephew, Ramzi Youssef, on his laptop before being captured as the alleged mastermind in the first attack on the Twin Towers, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. KSM said that the 9-11 operation could only handle four planes, when that's clearly not the case on Boston Logan Airport alone. That's why the CCTV security cameras are not released from the airport. Because the truth of the matter is, Boston Logan Airport on 9-11 was an inside job. Thank you for watching this film. independent storyteller, I need your support. Please consider donating through PayPal. Your help will help me in acquiring costly, unreleased archives from news networks to produce more films. YouTube has practically removed all monetizing features and incentives for most conspiracy theory historical skeptic content. And if you want to get early previews on my upcoming films as well as access to exclusive ones, then please become a Patreon as another means of support. Thank you, and please subscribe to my channels.